scapegoating the Christians again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? What? Okay. So if they, if they invented the scapegoat mechanism, would they somehow be immune to it? No, of course not. It's one, uh -huh. one of the lessons learned from psychoanalysis because you know that something doesn't mean you can escape it. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. there you go. Ebert, I've been really enjoying your music. I didn't, I, I didn't know who you were, you know, even before this was going on. And, and uh, uh, I really, I really, it's really my kind of music. Oh yeah. Especially the really relaxed stuff you did, like the campfire stuff and uh, yeah, hippie yeah. stuff. I, I, I can get, especially the live performances. I was like, whoa, okay. this guy is good. This is alive and awesome, uh, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry to flatter you like this. At, at no, no, life. no. I'm, I'm glad. It's always nice when I find shit like that out. You know, it makes me, makes me more relaxed because I'm in your sphere now. You know. Yeah. I, I used yeah. to listen to your music before you became a philosopher. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> is that good? Is that, is it, you can't have two careers. That's just too much because then you become a scapegoat. So avoiding the scapegoat mechanism in myself, I had to decide to be a philosopher and no longer a rock star. Here you go. Yeah. This yeah. is bullshit. Alex, I guess you're still really involved in music. You're not, you haven't making that, you haven't become a full-time philosopher like Alexander yet though, right? You're, you're, you're good still... Lord, I just had a fucking, sorry. Uh, my computer just started exploding with noise. Sorry. Oh, it's the AI. Yeah. It's the UFOs. It's uh, coming. So should I should I kick this off like more? You know. Oh, well, I, what, what I want to say. What I want to say was that I actually enjoyed this morning a conversation between our dear Ebert and his Ebertarianism, and uh, his friends Cattle Last and um, Tim Adlin. Uh, oh. And then this new guy who I've never seen before, who who is fantastic, called o, o. G. Rose. O. G. Rose, right? And you were having a conversation on the philosophy of the void. Okay, the philosophy of the void isn't really that new because negation has existed for a long time. So what we, we want to tackle today is an idea of the philosophy of the cool, which at mm -hmm. least to Western ears is quite new. I know Nigerians and Africans have been trying to pursue a tutu or whatever they call it, a philosophy of cool for like hundreds of years. So this is actually interesting in that we probably now are, are uh, four white guys uh, having hopefully an informed discussion on a philosophical phenomenon that should be credited to and has its roots in Africa. And that could be a philosophy of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we've already started, I think. I think you've already kicked off this podcast. So anyway, I just want to say welcome to, to Ebert. And um, I'm here with like, you know, the coolest people in the world, I think, probably. Um, uh, I think, I think, um, I think Thomas is, was, I think you were a member of, of Depeche Mode at one point. Uh, yeah, but I, I kind of keep quiet about that. Yeah. Anyway. Depeche um, who? Depeche Mode. Can we stop Depeche mentioning Mode? Depeche Mode? I hate yeah. Depeche Mode. I have nothing to, to do whatsoever with Depeche Mode. <laughs> this is an inside joke. Sorry, uh, Ebert. Anyway. I'm wearing a white shirt. Yeah, because he was always showing up in black, and then we, we kind of was saying, oh, Depeche Mode, Depeche Mode, and now he's in white all and, the time. And it doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, the philosophy of the cool. Okay, we got four people here, and why don't I go through each person? Well, well, and 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 you can, you can sort of give your spiel, your your philosophy uh, of the cool. Um, uh, you know, what is the cool, and 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 what is not the cool, and what is the corruption of the cool, and what is subversive can I, about can the I cool, start? and what is can good about the cool? Go for it, Alexander. Yeah. Okay, it was it was my idea. So yeah. uh, the thing is that. Um, I started pursuing a concept called attentionalism 21 years ago in the book, The Netocrats of John Sedekist. And this is really the most profound new idea in that book, but it, it's only taken people at least a couple of decades to start to begin to realize what we actually meant. Um, we declare uh, the forthcoming death of capitalism. We love capitalism, by the way, and so did Karl Marx. Uh, we think capitalism is a brutal, phallic force in history that, find, you know, gets a lot of bullshit and superstition out of the way because we can finally start pricing things across the globe. Anything that can be sold or can be in the market can finally have a price tag on it. That's essentially what capitalism does. So we don't belong to the sort of whiny crowd that says that capitalism is terrible, it will become alienated and that kind of bullshit. But uh, what we're saying in the book is that capitalism can no longer be the predominant force um, of a society where actually the capitalists 
have no access to their consumers any longer. So the pointer is that once the internet takes over the world and we all become interactive and we're all engaged in, in constant interactive communication, it will get incredibly hard for corporations, for example, to have access to people at all. Uh, because uh, we couldn't care less about advertising. We couldn't care less about marketing. We couldn't care less about... Those are the, most, those are the worst things we could think of today. And, and we sort of said the other day that the abolition of slavery is nothing compared to the abolition of advertising when we look back at it afterwards, historically. So we, we're getting to the point where the abolition of advertising suddenly mm -hmm. becomes feasible because the algorithms make sure that if we want something, some kind of information we can have access to that information. And if we don't have algorithms that are good enough to give it to us these days because they're corrupted or manipulated, we go and find algorithms that are better. That there's a free for all open global market for creating algorithms that actually give people exactly what they're looking for, which is infotainment. They want to be informed and they want to be entertained. Those are the only two values that really count in the internet world. And because corporations are terrible at teaching us things and they're terrible at entertaining us, they're dying and capitalism as we know it is dying. And this, this explains of course, deflationary pressure in the world economy and things like that that we see today in the 2020s. So that means that to get our attention, meaning to get our eyeballs and to get our eardrums and to get our senses and, and to have us engaged in any way whatsoever is the number one priority. And these days capitalists are so desperate. They don't care if we hate them as long as we react. And that means you have to be cool or something to, to get- No, wait a, second, wait a 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 second. So this means attention. And again, attention has a math theme, which is like mathematics without numbers. So the math theme is that attention equals credibility multiplied with awareness. So the awareness is over time. That means that you have to be credible because otherwise people just throw you in a spam box or put an ad blocker in front of you and they will never ever want to hear of you ever again. Which is exactly what we do today, 20 years later. So uh, you, had a, you have to have some kind of credibility so you're worth spending any sort of time on. So people think that their eyeballs and their eardrums should be spent on you, otherwise you're dead, okay? That value, whatever value that is, has to be multiplied with awareness. And here's the interesting thing with awareness. If you go to the French word attention, not the English word attention, because attention is what people mean with just being aware of something and that is gone. But attention in French means having somebody's attention for a prolonged period of time. So for example, if you're an influencer whore today and you try to market shit and you become the last desperate outpost for commercials and, and advertising, then you're more or less dead. You will have zero attentionist value in the long run. The only attentionist value you can accumulate over time is by being credible and then being long-term and by speaking the truth at all times and thereby supplying people with perfect information or knowledge. So what's your relationship entertain. between attentionalist uh, credibility and cool then? Okay, I'm coming to that, Andrew. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're an eager student, we appreciate that. The point is that while I'm interested in the philosophy of cool, and it's interesting that it's actually an African philosophy by origin, Itutu, is that in philosophy of cool, cool coolness is ultimately the most highest attentional value, at least if we apply it on a human being. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in exploring with you guys because I think the, the shared expertise the four of us have is a fantastic source to start developing a philosophy of cool as a larger philosophy of attention and attentionalism. That's my point. Okay, and, and probably the first thing we have to do is, is distinguish between this dignified manner of cool and this like pseudo cool or this commodified cool or, or whatever. Anyway. Yeah. So the, po the point here is that what Hammerick and Sweeney and Bard have discussed a lot prior is the scapegoat mechanism. And we've discussed it like in what ways the lynch mob different from uh, the noble uh, swarm. So the noble swarm is the exodus that leaves an old society, walks into the new or leaves an old territory, walks into new territory. So we have exodologists, we have these ideas about hyperjects, about heroic figures yeah, who lead us into the new, right? Yeah. But most of the time when human beings gather, they create lynch mobs and they have scapegoats and an anarchist steps out of that lynch mob who's a false phallus and takes on to lead the lynch mob and kill the scapegoat with the scapegoat mechanism in place. So we, we have we've sort of dug into that before. And the coolness here is the question is straightforward. Can we apply the word cool to the hyperject and does that mean that the anarchist is an uncool figure 
or do we have to talk about an authentic call and a false call here? Hmm. So, and I would love to involve Ebert in that because Ebert is a cool guy who's yeah. both a rock star and a philosopher, but he's younger and more handsome than me because I'm getting old now. So yeah. I thought involving Ebert in this conversation could be fantastic. I want to hear from Ebert too. And I want to also say that, you know, he did a fantastic presentation on, on, on the philosophy of the cool at the STOA, which is really worth listening to. And, and, um, and uh, anyway, um, let, let's, so what's your reaction to that, uh, to, to Alexander's presentation, Ebert, and, and what, how, how would you jive with that and how might you have some differences or nuances, you know? Well, um, I love it because it forces me to think about cool uh, in, in this larger context that is sort of more uh, geometric uh, to me uh, and, and vector-based. So, I think that for the purposes of this conversation, ideally we can disembody uh, cool from our sort of like, you know, synthomic attachment to the word as meaning awesome, and rather think about it strictly in the context of its attentional capacity uh, for sort of uh, behavioral um, manipulation essentially, uh, to describe uh, trans to, as a transactional analysis. Um, I could give an example of that. Simon Critchley, the British philosopher, has written an excellent book on humor, and it's not funny. Right. That's exactly the point. It's a really, he digs into the issue of humor. So I, sure. I agree with you completely that let's skip the whole thing about us applying. We're not fashion writers or anything like that at all. We, we mm. are seriously trying to conduct a philosophical exercise in if, if, if the word cool or a philosophical cool is applicable to hyperjectivity, objectivity, mm. and the things we've studied in the past when it comes to behavior in a digital age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what really is interesting to me in terms of uh, cool in the context of attentionalism is cool's ability to essentially invert the status paradigm where suddenly you have asymmet asymmetrical social status as competing with, um, with generalized status. So status being, and by the way, I think attention is really important because who the fuck is that? Is that me? Oh God, it's my daughter. Okay, let me turn this off. Um, she may keep calling and I don't know how to, let me quit this FaceTime, okay. Um, so when I think about death, Mortido, and I think about what the first sort of intrinsic motive, good Lord. Why don't you answer the phone? We can okay, let me answer the phone. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's, you're cool, you have a daughter. Hey, baby. Oh boy. All right, well, she may keep interrupt. She's the coolest person I've ever met, so it's, it's relevant. But um, anyway, so, so what I'm most interested in, for instance, you know, with apes and whatnot, averting your eyes is a sign of submissiveness. And then suddenly with humans, you can put on sunglasses, avert your eyes, and it's a sign of status. And how did we operationalize occlusion to sort of admit like a new paradigm of status? And attention is very important because when you're, when you're born, the first thing you need is attention. More than before food, before shelter, before anything, you need status. You need to be worthy of care. So I, I think that this idea of like, where do I situate myself intersubjectively, uh, intersubjectively um, in the group is sort of the premise of libido actually. So that status isn't one of many options, sex, et cetera, et cetera. Status is the thing, attention as sort of the premise of status, as Alexander was saying. Um, you know, what are our attentional needs as, as infants? Um, you know, and so that, that question of status and then dropping into sort of strength, health, sh shelter, food, and then sex, and then coming back to sort of aggregate a status is very interesting to me because previously in society, status was really defined by either strength or material accumulation. And somehow because of capitalism, because we could suddenly, the classes were suddenly um, ascendable, and because of frustration, being able to ascend those classes, we were able to invert, I think, the typically mimetic, and I'm interested to hear Hamilton's ideas on this, but into anti-mimesis, 
where the idea is, no, I don't need that, and therefore I hack status. And this idea of social asymmetry, uh, ascendant social asymmetry, being equally as sort of like uh, on an equal strata of status as um, of material accumulation, um, where the punk rocker uh, who eschews uh, material accumulation can be just as sort of like at the top of the status stack as, you know, a billionaire. Um, and the billionaire can sort of like desire what the punk rocker has or what their favorite musician has or some guy on the street who seems to not care. This idea of occlusion and saying, fuck you, you fucking fuck, which I live in New Orleans. That's the only t-shirt everybody wears here. The idea of inverting uh, belonging so that not belonging and including the belonging mechanism increases your status, I think is very interesting in the context of attention, uh, the attentional age that we're uh, dropping into. And it's much more powerful than money, right? This kind of status. Well, yes, because, because you know, minus X plus X equals zero, right? So I have nothing, I, I need the car. I don't have the car, I need the car. So I don't have the car, I'm in a place of lack. And then I need the car, I get X, and then I have zero. Minus X plus X is always zero. So then you can just skip the fucking equation. Cool is the skipping of the equation. So that instead of the plus and the addition, you just say minus zero. <laughs> I simply, I simply, God damn it. Okay. Hey, Burphy, I got to call you back, my love. What? I got to call you back. Because I'm doing a, a an interview. Hi, baby. Hey. <laughs> okay. All right. Buddy. She's, a, she's in TikTok shock. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, where the fuck was I? Oh, oh, oh. I, I, can, I can just add here Pick that yeah. when, we, when we talk about attentionalism, of course, there is proto attentionalism in oh, a capitalist society. So we can, like Hegel said, we can always in hindsight see the necessary patterns that were necessary in the sense that we arrived where we are. They were continued at the time, they're necessary in hindsight. So we can always say that, okay, now we know that attentionalism is taking over the world and capitalism is being subordinated to attentionalism. Then uh, we can ask all kinds of questions. And one of them is of course, where was attentionalism before this? And, and one of the places we need to look for that is of course, that we have this enormous pressure on the sacred in our society today. So you have enormous pressure on ourselves from all sides to put a price tag on family life, on love, on the things we love the most, especially on our own time, since we obviously we're gonna die. Like, so, so the pressure on us to, to, to give up on the things we value the most and put a price tag on them so they can, they can get put in the market is enormous. But that is just capitalism's last sort of supernova attempt at conquering everything. And the response to that will be an attentionist one, which just says that, no, there are things that are sacred. They cannot be traded, but that also means that the attentional value can only be the, not accumulated, not exchanged. But the potential value has its value precisely, for example, by me hanging out with other people who have an attentional value. Say, for example, you go to a nightclub and you're one of the cool guys. So you get, get to pass by the queue and you get to go into the nightclub and, and, and the nightclub owner walks up to you and he says, oh, you should be in the VIP lounge, by the way, just to, just to be, you know, safe from all the other people that are not bothering you. You should have your drinks for free because we really appreciate you here. You walk into the VIP lounge and then you discover that a Russian oligarch just paid his way into the VIP lounge. And of course you leave the nightclub because the tensionist value has been killed by capitalism. So whenever mm. somebody pays their way into sacred realm of any kind. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Then that is that is capitalism attempting to get in, but it's killed by attentionalism. Well, this is this, this was Luther's call for Protestantism. This, so the perfect example of proto-attentionalism was that when Luther said, if the Catholic Church is so desperate that they're selling letters that if you only pay enough, you get to go to heaven, which is the exact opposite of what Christ taught in the New Testament, then the Catholic Church has no longer nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity needs to be reformed and go back to its roots. And that was Luther's claim. So Luther was in that sense an eternalist to say that, who said that you cannot pay your way into heaven. 
Yeah. So it's a Christian essentialism responding to capitalism, saying, that, no, there are things that money cannot buy. Yeah. And the things that money cannot buy are now becoming the most precious things in our society. And we don't want to be part of anything else except uh, with other people who have attention on a par with ourselves. So and I'm this interested. This creates the new power network. This creates the new sort of sophisticated network of power in our society, which is fiendishly difficult to get inside of. But, you know, since most people will not answer an email if you send an email to them, you're not part of their networks. And that means you don't have attentional value according to them. Yeah, I'm interested in this connection between uh, the cool and the sacred because, because it seems like cool is a transgression of the sacred on one level. And then it's also it's also acknowledging the sacred or, or it's, it's, it's asking, it's, it's doing both at the same time. Like there's a nihilistic aspect to cool, which is destructive of, of, of the sacred. And then there's also, uh, there's also a clearing of the space for the sacred in, in, in the cool or, or something like that. Maybe, maybe hey, Thomas can, can Thomas, talk Thomas, about Thomas, that. Thomas, 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 perfect Thomas question. You can yeah, talk about Thomas the question is, Girardian is this, wait a second. Is the the scape, sacred. Does the scapegoat need to be cool to have any scapegoat value? Because that's a question I want to ask Thomas. Mm. Does the no, does, does the scape scapegoat need to be cool? Uh, no, not no. at all. In fact, often the scapegoat is, is not cool. Often it's somebody who is very weak and easy to kill without repercussion, repercussions. But there is an example of where where um, where coolness is, is combined with um, with scapegoating, and that's comedy. So when you are um, when you're trying to make an audience laugh, then basically the audience is the mob and you are the scapegoat. But you're kind of a very um, a very skillful scapegoat, and you you do it in 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 the right way so that the audience doesn't um, doesn't kill you, so to say. So you so you can't order people to laugh. So if you want make you want to make people laugh, you have to be you have to put yourself in a very vulnerable position, and you run the risk of being killed by the mob. So comedians can be considered called cool scapegoats. I believe Girard has has written something about uh, about that in uh, in uh, Things Hidden in his, uh, one of his main books. I'd, so I'd like to pick up on form the... of scapegoating, right? But it's not maybe it's not actual scapegoating. And so, anyway, go well, ahead. No, I was just going to pick up on the right? on the comedy thing. Um, I, I, in my view, comedy, in this sense, is a vicarious transgression of status. Um, so fucking with the status order, fucking with asymmetry, um, becoming extremely asymmetrical. Uh, so for instance, to, you know, the status quo um, is a lot of what comedians do. They push the boundaries and we get a vicarious transgression through them. Um, they're not permissionaries, they're exhibitionists. They don't give us permission. We sit in the audience and we get a vicarious transgression uh, through that, because of course, fucking with the status order is dangerous. And then, you know, we get into the ideas of the void and the ideas of what happens when you transgress, you get excommunicated, you get occluded. And the, the, the quality that turns the loser into the loner is the one who says, I have, um, I have sovereignty. I have, I can survive out there. I have a cigarette, I have fire in my hand, or I don't give a fuck. I can, I can exist outside of the paradigm and I'll be fine. And that sort of like reduction, you know, the cool club is the one that you can't enter. And the most re reduced sort of club that excludes the most people is the self. And that's why when you see James Dean or you see Elvis or you see they're not with girls or you see Batman or you see Spider-Man and they're all saying, I love you, but I can't be with you. It's because the most reduced aspect of sort of sovereignty is the self and the idea that you can exist outside of that status in the void as a shaman. And um, oh, 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 wait, wait, you just said shaman. Yeah, I think that's important here because let's not confuse this sovereign with individualism, the way we know it in the West from the last 400 years. I'd like to avoid that because I think the shamanic caste aspect here, the shamanoid personality is rather key because the shaman walks into the village, but it's not part of the village. And therefore the shaman can be, for example, a comedian or a medicine man or, or be the guy who freaks out completely and, and is allowed to do all kinds of things nobody else is allowed to do. Although he's still running the risk 
bigger risk than anybody else of being scapegoated. But at least he, he's, he's like his pre-programmed. His archetype is to do the things he does. He doesn't know any better, so he does exactly those things. And the sort of modern coup we had in the 20th century that the media industry tried to exploit as much, as much as they could was rather playing a lot with shamanoid personality types. So sure. the, sovereign, the sovereignty is not that I'm not with you. The sovereignty is that I'm from another world than you are. I'm from outside the community where we are loners. That's true. But we do fuck and, and we, do, we, do, we do have relationships well, of, of with other we, humans. Of course. of course they fuck. Of course we fuck because it's pure mortito. It's pure pre-libido. It's pure, uh, you know, okay. So to put Bard's previous thing into like a, a, an equation, the highest status previously is where you have everything. So then you need nothing. I like this sort of equation. And so the hack is to just need nothing, right? You just need nothing. I don't need to have everything. I need nothing, which is a piercing of the void. And that's the mortito. The idea that I don't need attention, that I don't need to live. I don't need that to live is sort of the mortito and the hyper uh, libido. I mean, it's like a black hole that kind of sucks that attention in, even though it's- well, I should, I should qualify that this is all semblance, unless it's the real thing. Yeah. But it's very difficult to tell the difference between the real thing. For instance, once we have auto-tune, <laughs> we can't necessarily tell the difference between a great singer and a bad singer. And once we have cool, it's very hard to tell the difference between someone who truly does not need status and someone who is pretending they don't need status. And then we dialectically get to position we don't care whether it's auto-tune or not, because that whole question is over and done with it. It's only old exactly. people who care about it. So, but I would say th th this is dialectical deeply. This is what fascinates me with the cool concept is that this is deeply dialectical. Whenever you check a dictionary for the word cool, it will, the first thing it will say is that incredibly fiendishly hard to define, obviously because it changes over time. So I would say today, 2020s cool would be like you said, it'd be somebody who needs nothing because we had a society where everybody sort of grabbed towards the individualist capitalist, the citizen Kane kind of ideal, being wealthy, successful, having a long box, a long list of boxes ticked before you die, having huge wealth, whatever, and then you were the cool guy. And suddenly all of that was so over the top that it died. Uh, and, and, and nakedness, nothingness, all those things we've seen the last 10 years, that's just the beginning of a new paradigm, or at least the purity in between paradigms where we're stuck at the moment where none of that gets interesting any longer. It's just, just too predictable, too boring. Well, narcissism, is the, narcissism is the most uncool thing you could pursue today, obviously, because sure. we have it everywhere and too much of it. Yeah. So okay, I, I wanna maybe just jump us for a moment into, into sort of the attentional world, like maybe post-capitalist or trans-capitalist, because I was thinking a lot about this last night and I'm reading from these whiteboard notes I was writing last night. Um, if, Attentionalism. Okay, so I just want to talk about media. So media, this is just my opinion, but I think it's fairly solid. Media starts off, media is an eternalizing mechanism. So this is going to seem like a diversion, but I think it's really uh, like important. Media has always been an eternalizing mechanism. You write on the wall in a cave so that it lasts from day to the next day. You eternalize the message. And, you know, Achilles needs a famous, a, a renowned Threnos. He needs a song, a famous song to achieve the immortality. And he relies, of course, on the muses to sing that song. But now we're all fucking muses because we all are within the medium. And because of that, we're all playing with these, this eternalization of status, where every time we get on this thing, we're eternalizing ourselves. And so we're sort of avoiding the void just by engaging in this we're sort of eternalizing ourselves an erasure of the void an erasure of bio mortido but something else then becomes our mortido something else becomes the void and the shamanism must destroy media or re or, or create a glitch in the matrix or uh, you know and uh, um, uh, uh, Sweeney I want to hear your thoughts on them um, on Jiangchen or, you know, creating sort of the glitch in the matrix, but just to keep going with this media thing for just a second. So suddenly we are, we're eternalized. We've seen to uh, solve the void so that the shaman who pierces the void for us and the loner and the rebel and descent who are all flirtations with Mortito and create a lot of libido, 
Um, suddenly now that seems to be all solved. And I think that's why we see sort of a disappearance of cool because it's very hard to act like a loner on social media, right? Because obviously the very act at a party or, or just down the street in real life, it's a little different. But anyway, so Bart, I'm curious what you think about this. The rise of techno mortido, and I haven't read dig Digital Libido yet, but I would imagine that this techno mortido uh, uh, would be sort of the new uh, void, where we have our eternalized state, but disruptions or glitches in that state, glitches in the matrix, if you will, create sort of this, this collective fear so that desire slash libido is translocated to multiple loci in discrete attentional compression. So that we're all focused on, you know, these are the, the idea of membranic. So we're all focused on this thing and that thing and this thing. And these create these sort of like membranes, these compressions of attention. So this is in the abstract in the disembodied age of the internet. And those uh, which are incidental groupings um, concentrate the libidinal force in a translocated way. So it's not my libido, it's our libido. It's the libido that's existing sort of, um, you know, over here and over here. And these libidinal comp compressions of attention grow in salience, becoming more erect as they grow and literally fuck the system. And why, you know, why would you think that? Because you have a problem here. It's the audience problem. You seem to take the audience being there for granted. The death of God well, today is really the death of the phallic gaze. Media is, being no media is being mass produced interactively across the world, but hardly anybody sees anything any longer because everybody's producing media and there's no audience exactly. left. So there's a shift. We read about this in Digital Libido. There's a shift for just for once in history, this shift away from the narcissistic display of power. So anybody who was powerful in the past would always display it. You would, you would have your castle. You would have your court. You would have your court theater. You would perform, right? Priests would perform. Kings yeah. would perform. They perform. And the last part of that was, was capitalism, when sort of we fostered the media elite to perform in front of everybody. And because of television and very few outlets, they had an audience, right? What has happened now is the audience is gone. Yes. There's no audience left. What is the only no. thing that's left is that a few small elites actually are exhibitionistic and voyeuristic with each other within these sort of tribes that they then create. And that is where the only value now resides because the mass audience is gone. And the only way to get a mass audience these days is, is perfectly through ironic reality TV freak show stuff. And that's where nobody wants to be. So th that's why th th the social theater is dead because we produce too much media. It's like the whole theater was emptied. Everybody was suddenly up on the stage performing to one another, waiting for an audience to applaud. And there was an audience there. So just for once, it's the voyeurs that everybody's dying to find. But the voyeur, the ultimate voyeur is God watching us and he's gone. He got bored, he left. So right, God, well, the left the, God, the observer left the building. Rather than right. Well, the voyeur, the voyeur becomes the rebel, the dissenter. The voyeur becomes the shaman. I mean, the voyeur becomes the outsider. And I guess I'm, I'm entirely agreeing with you. And the disappearance of... Uh, of uh... Yeah, the voyeur today builds an atomic uh, war safe bunker in New Zealand and retracts. And retraction is key here. It's Simon Critchley's concept, 2013, very important. He said, this is not a time for evolution. This is a time for retraction. So anybody who has the slightest bit of power and influence, symbolic, imaginary, real power in the digital age will retract. And they will retract into their closed communes where they only meet those they like to meet. So Burning Man used to be that 20 years ago. Now it's too exposed to the outside world. So you go to smaller and smaller and smaller events of participatory culture and things like that, because there you only get to see the people you want to see. And you make sure there are thresholds and tantric walls and membranes and barred absolutes. So only those can get in who you would like to be there. And as soon as somebody walks in through the building, you don't want to be there, you, you have the right to leave. So but I think it, coolness, coolness think, now is more a tribal thing than it is an individual thing. That's but don't you think, yeah, sure. But, don't, but isn't digital libido, does, mustn't it be translocated out of the personal into the group so it exists in a distributed fashion? I think the libido has always been tribal. I think, I think sex was always ritual. I think violence was always ritual. That I think Thomas's point here is valid as well because the lynch mob, the opposite of the lynch mob is the sexual ritual. So we always did that, not collectively, but tribally. So tribal, tribal is, is that tribal is in all my philosophy, said at least, is the normal state of things. 
And any idea of individualism is basically taking the shaman who performs on his own and then making him an ideal for society only briefly. And it didn't work. And it made us tragic. And that's exactly what we're dealing with now. We try to go back to tribal in the smoothest possible way. But I sure. think tribal cool or the tribe is cool is is the only way we're heading. And you're cool, you're sort of intercool with the other cool within certain networks, which is a way of describing that we put a wall around ourselves. We have this sort of digital gated community. We don't want to deal with the outside world. We think 90% of humanity are deplorables. We don't want to have anything to do with them whatsoever. And that is going to be the new netocratic elite. That's what they're going to live. That, that's what they're going to ask for. That's what they're going to demand. And while everybody wants to be part of them because they're not selling themselves, because they're not, there's, there's no way to pay to become netocratic. But Otherwise, then, there wouldn't be a paradigm shift. You cannot pay your way to become an etocrat. You just have to be it. You have to know the codes. You have to understand what it means to be an etocratic, symbolically, imaginarily, or real. But you have to understand that to be part of it, you cannot buy your way in because if you, this is chapter nine of the netocrats. If you would buy your way in, it would just be another completely commercialized, destroyed Coca-Cola finance nightclub, and you'd hate it. Sure, but then the only mortito left at that stage is the destruction of the medium, the eternalizing mechanism. So in order to, and, and that would be the only fear, that would be the only void is the destruction of the mothership. Well, isn't your description of mortito is too active to me? Mortito is just death. It's, it, it's just that within you that is there all the time relentlessly, but wants nothing. It, will, it, will, it does not even want to die. That's a Shishekian description of death drive. That's how I use Mortido. Libido is then a sort of denial of Mortido into the subconscious that then returns as the conscious conviction that they're libidinal. And that is sex and violence and art, all the things we call pathos, right? Those are the things that then pop up that makes us distinctly human today and not machines. Those are the things that are libidinal in our work. So that's how we describe libido and digital libido. Okay, but then Mortito, in, in needing nothing, needs not the eternalized state, and then running away from the eternal, uh, running away. What do you mean, Mortito needs nothing? I, Mortito needs food and water and, well, Mortito is sustaining your, it's sustaining itself. It, it's, it, it doesn't even kill itself. That's the thing with Mortito. Well, well from a, from a Girardian point of view, uh, Mortido is actually when you want so much that you've given given up on the possibility that it ever comes true. So that would be that would be uh, Girard's Mortido, right? So you you've turned the the entire universe into an obstacle. You know, you're never gonna get the wife you want, the job you want, the money you want, the the body you want. And, and that means that you, you you basically everything is is rivalry, and and then you you just give up. And the ultimate giving up is just simply death. And that's basically that. So, the, so that's why Girard says that ultimately um, taking desire to its logical conclusion is death because you end up with, with turning uh, the entire universe into a rival. So that would be, uh, and it, it's very compatible with what, uh, what, uh, with Freud's Mortido, right? But Freud kind of posits it as some kind of. Um, let's say platonic uh, essence that we have we just do this just like the Oedipus complex you know we just do this while well, Girard has an explanation of why it's there that's so that's why I, I, I like uh, well that's one of the reasons why I like Girard right it's so parsimonious yeah. the explanation I, I, I would add and I think Shishik would agree with me that it, Mortido is more zombie like so yeah zombie like it's that it's that, w that within you that yeah, lives uh, although death, it doesn't right? want to live yeah. Don't be like, yeah. uh, but you yeah, know, I was listening right. to Ebert it talk. Try, I was listening to you, you talk, e Ebert, about about the need for this death ritual, um, you know, to be fully alive. So, so there has to be a confrontation with 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 death. But that's not the same thing as Mortito. Mortito is like is like when you don't have that um, passage, in a sense, right? Yeah, you described libido, Andrew. That's what libido is. Libido, libido is, libido, but you need to... There's an obstacle. And there's also the, so Martita something is about... the motor of libido, but it's not... What happens is that there's a motor of the libido, but there's an obstacle, like Thomas said, which is yeah. also very jarring. The obstacle turns Martita into libido. So it's it's very much negation of negation. So suddenly the... Yeah. And there's libido there. And the libido seems to want something. The libido is a desire that desires something. It desires desire itself, obviously. And, and it's a drive, it's mechanistic, it has this character that, that you know, it's still there. Well, both Mutido and Libido have drive characteristics. There's instinct, which yeah. both is Libido and Mutido. And there's transcendence, which is the attempt of a pure Libido without Mutido at all. 
which is yeah. basically just a dream that we apply onto things, project onto things. For example, when we are on deathbed about to die, we hope but, our children will live but, in a better but future. My but my point is, we can't do anything about it, right? My That's point is that when, 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 you deny, when you deny death, then you, then you ex live in a death, death, deathly state. You live in a, a, a state well, of mor Mortito, right? Exactly. No, no, that's my definition also, is that the void exists, then you have Mortito, which is sort of avoidance of the void, and then in order to sort of recuperate that, you have your libido. But I guess what I'm saying is that that presence of the void um, is that, that, let's say, the void is over here, and cool, the people that are cool seem to play with that and transgress their own Mortito to express this sort of like, I don't self immolative capacity. And I think that that capacity, which we all sort of uh, explain as, you know, self destruction, punk rock, whatever the case is. It's Tantra as well, right? We can bring Tantra into the discussion yeah, here because Tantra is an intentional transgression, which, which sort of frees you from, from, from the Mortito, I think. I'm with Andrew here, but not with Ebert, because I think it's very dangerous to try to build a general theory of cool. Cool changes. Cool is dialectical. And once we figured out that something has been cool for quite a while, we sort of figured that out. When once mm -hmm. it figured out, it loses its mystique. It's That's why I tie that. coolness to shamanic, but I tie it also to pra paradigmatics. So paradigmatics means that it changes over time because the conditions change. It's a very Aristotelian yeah, but, rather Plato's sort word of it. So, so well, cool I was thinking that sure, just but, as an example, that it used to be California, it used to be cool, and now Texas is cool. So I'll, give like, but, but, I'll give you a better example. I'll give you a better example. No, Rest Texas it, is it. cool for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, it's not even cool any longer under you too. Old. Oh, okay. So, it's, it's, right. yeah, yeah. I'm not very Utah cool. Utah so is I, cold. I, I'm probably Utah, one step behind. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, again, a better example. Brett Easton Alice is a really <laughs> good, he's sort of a gay, clever writer. And they're very good at sort of new, uh, observing nuances in contemporary culture. The best way to do that is to read somebody like, say, Brett Easton Alice. And in white, he discussed the difference between Madonna and Lady Gaga. It might, might sound like an old topic, but it's very interesting. So the 2010s, Lady Gaga came along and had her sort of second wave after she made a mystery of herself. She came back with a sort of nakedness about herself and a sort of abruptness and brutality about herself that actually was genuine. Whereas Madonna tried another comeback, you know, her face was like that, she was 60 years old. But the problem wasn't really that Madonna's music was that crap. And the problem wasn't really that Madonna was old. She could have been cold like him. But the problem was Madonna tried to play the same game she'd played for the last 40 years. Yeah. You gotta change the game, don't you? Like if the times hadn't changed and she looked she didn't look old. She just looked boring and predictable and, yeah. and, and safe. And, yeah. and, and, and she, she looked like she'd figured it all out. Like yeah. if she'd found out a sort of general theory of cool that could always apply to herself. When in reality, people just thought, was there all there was to it? Was there all there was to it in the 1980s, 1990s? Glamour gone, all gone because Madonna just made a prick of herself by trying to do the same thing again. When she should just, by just checking around in the society, sort of feel what kind of society she lived in, at least, you know, a minimum of artistic integrity, uh, she would have seen that her story was no longer interesting the way she did it. She had become yeah. totally uncool. Well, that's so, why Ebert's music, like you, you kind of, you changed your, you changed yourself a lot, right? You, you took a risk of taking a well, radical change and you were rejected by the record companies. Yes, but, 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 so, but, but so I'd like to, I mean, that's specifically why there is a general theory of cool. So everything Bard just described can be characterized mathematically. As soon as things become non-asymmetrical and saturate a society, they become uncool. And that's why they move. That's why California goes to Texas. That's why Berlin goes to Mexico City. That's why any of these things, anything that's lame becomes primed for cool because cool requires social asymmetry. And that's why I'm really interested in how that interrelates with sort of a Girardian analysis of mimetic desire, because it seems to me this is the like- The scapegoat becomes cool. The scapegoat who is the, who is the most awkward yes. individual becomes yes. cool, right? Yes. Once he's been scapegoated. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's why I knew that, for instance, or... earnestness, in 2000, 2006, you still couldn't smile on stage. It was illegal, right? You couldn't be earnest. It was fucking illegal. And I knew, okay, this is the most punk rock move I can make, is to be earnest, because it's totally illegal. It's the lamest thing you can do. And that's now we have a whole bunch of like bullshit folk pop bullshit. And now it's fucking lame again to be earnest. And that's okay, because this, of this, this is shamanic. Alex, this is shamanic. The shaman 
has to figure out every time he walks into the village to perform his ritual, he has to figure out a, a way of doing it differently than they did the last time. Because otherwise people will not believe in the magic. But it's not just hey, different wait. than, it's, it's not just change. He but it's not, it's, it. it's not mathematical, for God's sake. Then Ray Kurzweil would have been cool. And he's like the uncool <laughs> person ever. <laughs> yeah. Dead or alive doesn't matter. He's always uncool. Ray Kurzweil's, if, if you want to have a general theory here, Ray a Kur general theory of uncool. And Ray, Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil, I got news for you. Unfortunately, Ray's, Ray Kurzweil was cool for a little no. while, if you remember. No. Yes. No. Yes. He might become yes. cool in 100 years if as some kind of weird start thing that <laughs> wait <laughs> wait can we can we just skip the curse file the k word uh -huh. here because i'm but getting asymmetry triggered by it so we can go back to the issue the problem here is that i would say no no i th i'd say this is definitely pathical this is where i disagree with you everton that's interesting i would say this is deeply pathical when it's pathical it's not logical it cannot be reduced to mathematics it cannot be reduced to, to calculations it is precisely the surprising intuitive little thing that took a risk that you didn't know that is the coolest thing and then sets the standard for the next cool. And that cannot per definition be calculated because otherwise the AI would figure out instantly how to be cool and AI won't do that. It, it is not necessarily that you can calculate or predict what is next going to be cool, but in retrospect, you can always see why are mom jeans cool now? Because they were lame. Why is- Wait, it wait, cheating. Retrospect, no. no, necessity always arrive in retrospect, but that doesn't mean it could have been calculated prior to it happening. That's exactly where you make a mistake here. You must go more Hegelian. You cannot calculate prior to the event, an event that includes a any pure event. Sort of pathical you mode. A pure any, event. If you have anything pathical in a mathing, that's but fine, but those events have to you cannot calculate it prior to it happening because then every record company would have done that years ago and they haven't. And that's exactly why they're on cool. And that's and that's right. fine. But cool, these events of cool do follow a mathematical formation. Everything no. that's cool was previously asymmetric. Name one thing that's cool and I'll show you how it was asymmetrical. One name, Asymmet name asymm asymm wait a second. Asymmetrical nothing with mathematics. I said Mathematically, mathematically okay. means geometrically. Yeah. Geometrically. No, not even geometry. You got to understand this. When you do attention, you're going to start value attention. You can only value one attention to the next one. The only way you can do the mathematics is transfinities and infinities. The only way to do that is that you cannot have any exact numbers involved in any of this. You can only have a value one by having the other value and comparing the two. That, that's when you move into pathical measurements. And when you do pathical measurements, you cannot fall into logos and logic at all. There has to be a, a chaos principle. Uh, is that what you're saying in a way? No, no. I'm saying, this is being too difficult, but I'm saying is that you got to understand that pathos is not logos. You got to dig into what pathos is. You got to dig into what sex is. You got to dig into the ontology of violence. You got to dig into the ontology of art. You got to dig into the surprising elements, the power elements, the relationships that are involved in these things, and they mm. cannot be mathematically calculated. I tell you, I, 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 I was going to save humanity. I Maybe pseudo cool can be mathematically calculated. I, I can, yeah, I no completely way. disagree. I can tell right. you right now <laughs> how long mom jeans have before they're uncool again, because as soon as I it, don't do mass cool, because that's not cool. My yes, point but, is but that I do mass cool. We're talking, about, dead, Everett. we're talking Mask about the dead. abstraction. We're talking about the abstraction of attentionalism. And what I'm saying is that once something has enough attention, you can predict with relative accuracy when that cool is going to dissipate. Wait if a I second. Wait a second. I did not say coolness and attention were the same thing. I'm not saying they're the same thing. You just made that assumption. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying that something that is asymmetrical and growing in attention is cool. Why? Then hatred would be cool too. It's a it lot is. of things that are asymmetrical. And Guess what? In that case. Guess what? Guess what? After after um, after Charlottesville and the attack with all the racists and, and all that shit, I went on a Daily Stormer, which is a Nazi neo-Nazi uh, website, and I just I was doing my book on cool. I was doing research. Are they talking about themselves as as if they're cool? Yes, of course. On okay. Daily Stormer, they're saying, "Go out." This was the quote. Go outside, go out to bars tonight. You guys did it. You're the bad boys now. Every girl is want, gonna wanna suck your dick. That was the message to the neo-Nazis because they had created an, an ascendant asymmetry. You're mistaking, this is not what I said when I said hatred. Cause that's right. a group that do love each other and they love each other's dicks and pussies and they fuck each other. It's just a community and a tribe. 
So if you remove your morality here or sure. you know, standard moralism, then that was not an example at all. I say asymmetries are very abundant. Okay, asymmetries in themselves do not prove anything. They just ascended, show of ascended asymmetries. Okay, now I, I, I would strongly argue that one of the things that humans take to a machines can only observe in hindsight through you know record sales or whatever is coolness. And I think we need to save the term cool for it being a strictly dialectical term, incredibly fiendish, hard to understand and to, to grasp. And I, I, I disagree strongly that there can be a general theory of cool. I think that in itself is uncool. Of course okay, I want to see my point. I want to introduce another thing. I think Hold that on, I completely agree with, with Ebert and his, his essential general theory of cool. And that is entirely correct, at least from the Girardian point of view. And that is it's somebody who emulates a total uh, absence of lack. This person has it together and it doesn't, that person doesn't need the external world. Now, if you can put yourself in that position and people believe it, people will see you as incredibly cool. Now, how you do that, whether you do it as a rock star, as a billionaire, as a, a monk in a, in a monastery, that's something else. But all of these people have one thing in common, and that is that they seem to exist independently without needing anything. And if you, if you, and so this is the difference between fake cool and real cool. So if you do that from a, in a temporary way, if you can say like in this position, when I play this song or when I do this performance or when I, when I build this house, I can be in this complete position of this, this, this absence of lack. So call it a flow state or whatever you want. But the problem starts when people want to prolong this. So they actually want to be cool. So that's not just when they do that performance or when, when they build that house or when they are a father, but they, are, they want to be in that state of apparent perfection at all times. And then it becomes fake. And of course, people quickly see this transition from I am cool, I got it together, to yesterday I was cool. If I behave in the same way today, I should still be cool. And then you're fooling only 90% of the people. And on the second day, you're only fooling 50% of the people. And at the last day, nobody is, is, is fooled anymore. And then uh, the, 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 the balloon pops, right? And then you lose your cool. And that's why you have these cycles, right? So it's constantly people trying to convince others, look, I have perfection on my side. And of course, the people who are looking at, at that perfection, they are in the position of the masochist, of course. Because in some sense, the person who is cool is in the position of the sadist or the person who, who states the prohibition. I have something that I'm not giving to you. So that would be the, the Girardian explanation of cool. And then it, it generates that convinces, envy, that convinces right? me. It generates that envy. Me. Uh, like this is the envy that, that Gerard talks about. Yes, right? yes, very and much envy is this emotion that we don't want to envy. admit to ourselves. We don't want to admit that, to ourselves that we're envious of other people because they're more cool than us. And, and so this creates a, you know, a constant state of envy. Yeah, it doesn't have to be, it can also be admiring. So it doesn't have mm. to be envious. You could sure. work away from the envy as well, especially if you're going to be tribally cool. So say you've got a different cool characters within a group that together are cool, then certainly having different types of coolness strengthens the group rather than everybody being the same, right? So admiration can be replace envy, but it takes effort because otherwise we fall into the envy trap very, very easily, which I think is also Girard's point. Otherwise, so, Girard so, would have written books. Unless so there was one, one more point that's life. important, and that is that, that, so if you want to stay cool, suppose that you want to stay cool, I mean, we're kind of like, it's a caricature, right? How do you stay cool over a long period of time? That means that you constantly change because you constantly need to adapt to new situations where you can look cool. So, so the, the, par the paradox is that somebody who is, really, who is really cool is not there because that person is changing all of the time uh, depending on the, on the uh, circumstances. And that's why somebody like David Bowie, for example, has yeah. been relevant for many decades. If you look at, at how that person is in the world, David Bowie is always different. And that's, why he, that's how he could remain and genuinely so and it's the opposite of fashion, right? Because David Bowie is always one step ahead of the fashion, right? And so, exactly. is, so is Bob Dylan. And these guys are never, they're never, they're never trying to imitate or, or mimetically copy something. They're, they're always ahead, of, one step ahead. So well, it depends on what, what you mean cool with fashion. It depends on what you mean with fashion, Andrew. Let, let's not use it in the derogatory manner. Well, in the derogatory sense, in the copying sense, in the mimetic sense. Don't do that because... Right. <laughs> The I'm point not saying that, that the original no, wait, fashion can, people are... No, wait, are, are, wait, are, are, Andrew, are, my point. Can I yeah. give my point? My point <laughs> is this one. It is that, uh, it is that 
the, the temporality is the key here. So I don't think we disagree. Maybe Herbert and I don't disagree and Thomas is the bridge between us here because what Thomas said made perfect sense. So if you want to move towards, it's much of a general theory call as you possibly could have, or I would call it the philosophical call because I prefer to call it that. But you say you have a philosophical call, then, then it is precisely by being in the times you live ahead of the time. So you're contingent in your behavior but your behavior afterwards looked necessary. And that's why imitators would then perceive that as fashion when they try to look like you. Mm -hmm. So in that but, sense, actually it can be very powerful. So for good reasons or bad reasons, that means both the anaject. Adolf Hitler could walk in his costume at Nuremberg and the next year, everybody wanted to wear an Adolf Hitler costume, but you could also have a hyperdeck. We can always say Martin Luther King because I want to save him from woke anyway. So he's like one of the good guys. But Martin Luther King though, is somebody you could mimic and try to be like him the following year and do a lot of good because of what he did. So the, oh, the, okay, the, both the hyperjective and the adjective character can, can use this. Cool in this sense, scale enough can be neutral. But okay, and, and I like I would like to keep us in that state where we're looking at cool as neutral and not as awesome, so that we don't need to defend cool, which I feel like you're doing a little bit. And and my point is that you can stay cool as as um, as Hamerick just described by as soon as you get to a saturate a saturation point, and, and as uh, Sweeney mentioned, staying ahead. What does staying ahead of the of fashion mean? It means looking for um, asymmetries looking for places that are not occupied because otherwise you cannot stay ahead. Fashion is when things have become popular. And in order to stay ahead, you must look for things that are not yeah, popular. But you must also take a risk. That is the risk. That is the risk. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah, no. Not automatically. Yeah, but you got to stay ahead so far ahead that you take a risk and you make a fool of yourself occasionally as well because otherwise the coolness will be gone in no time But that's exactly Then you just look speculative and cynical. And once you get speculative and cynical, the coolness will die quite quickly. Of course. And the reason I have personal experience with this is because I decided to be earnest, an earnest fucking hippie, unprofessional, not cool, not wearing black, looking like a fucking bum. And all of us, because that was the least cool thing I could do, I got slammed by every uh, gatekeeper of cool, Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, everyone, everyone. Especially, by the way, because I was a punk rocker in my previous band, I'm a Robot, I was purely sardonic, I ironic, all the things that cool are supposed to be. And then I flipped the script and they freaked out because I fucked with the paradigm of cool. But what ended up happening is a fucking cascade of imitators of me. All of a sudden you start, hear, for real, I'm not joking, like all of a sudden you start hearing uh, acoustic songs with people going, hey! Denge, 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 hey, every fucking commercial. And so guess what I had to do? On my second album, I had a, a, a song that was exactly like Home, which is my big hit. Home, let me come home, home is that song. I had another song that was just like it. I could have capitalized because at that point, by the second album, there was a bunch of imitators. But I couldn't do it because I suffer from vanguardism, which is the idea that I always must stay ahead. It was no longer attractive to me. I felt like I would be a capitalist fraud in the true sense if I did capitalize on it, if I did repeat it. And as you said, the shaman does not repeat only in the instance that it's already been um, appropriated at scale. Once it's been appropriated at scale, the shaman is irrelevant. And so the shaman looks for the next thing. And that's why this social asymmetry thing is important. And I think in the atten attentional aspect, when we think about attention, I think social asymmetry is really interesting. So I, th I, I would like to sort of think about this in the abstract in terms yeah, of- you, Have you read Walter Benjamin's text from the 1930s? A uh, few. Yeah, he was like the young genius of the Frankfurt School. And he wrote about the avant-garde, a word that has obviously been destroyed yes. since then and no. dirtified and, and totally uncool by now. But when he wrote about the avant-garde in the 1930s, that's exactly why the word became cool, was Walter Benjamin's text. And this was his hope that in an ever-changing society with increasing rapid technological change, that there could be an avant-garde that actually could guide people to walk forward. He was Jewish, by the way, and obviously he was in opposition to Hitler and the Nazis, that he came up with this idea that somebody's got to move out of this mess we're moving into right now, because he mm. saw Hitler and Stalin, you know, basically swallowing the world and killing 100 million people out of him. And he himself died in the Second World War. Tragically. Committed suicide. He committed suicide. He committed suicide, yeah. believing he was going to get caught by the Nazis. Yeah. 
So it, Walter Benjamin's story in that sense personifies this. And obviously he's now considered the coolest of philosophers. He's got, you can't kill the cool of Walter Benjamin. He's like the James Dean of philosopher or something. But, but he wrote about this and, and he was passionate about it, very serious about it. I think, I think he's a good place to start with yeah. Walter Benjamin text in the 1930s because philosophy of cool has arrived in the West very late from Africa, obviously. We now need to start studying it deeply because we now need to understand attentionalism quickly at least those of us who want to understand what's going on. And, 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 and I think it's part of it. But I like to keep attention separate from a study of cool. Well, I like uh, Ebert's idea that, that you could repurpose cool in some way, but there's a fine line, I guess, between doing that and, and you know, having that a new, being a new kind of cynical you know, um, strategy. Well, so, so for instance, at my shows, one thing I do to get everybody dancing, I raise my hand, I say, who here is cool? And a bunch of people raise their hand. I go, okay, you guys don't have to dance. We understand you've earned it, right? Who here is uncool? And then I raise my hand and everybody else raised their hand. I go, okay, we're lame, let's dance. And the idea is that this uh, uh, social- Sorry? Scapegoating to scape bring the tribe together. <laughs> scapegoating, <laughs> well, scape, scapegoating well. at scale, scapegoating at scale to create permission to absolve ourselves of status anxiety. And I think that status anxiety, like I haven't sort of presenced yet, but that, that is sort of the, dra that is the invisible hand because what we're really afraid of, the void, what the void really is, because intersubjectivity is the most salient aspect of our being, our void is excommunication. And so the, the super strength of ourselves is this idea that, you know, the Girardian idea, I don't need anything. I need nothing. I either have everything and I need nothing or fuck yeah, you. Yeah, but Ebert, Ebert, sorry if I'm ruining the, Please. Really find a bit here, but that's not the entire evening. So number one, you reward the guys for having bought a ticket to come to your show or at least showing up. Sorry? So you're rewarding them. You're rewarding the fans in a capitalist or a tenseless manner. A capitalist sure. manner, it means you bought a ticket, I sure. reward you. Or a tenseless manner, you showed up, I reward you. Okay. So you reward them. So there's already their membrane between them and the outside world. So you're creating a cool within the we don't need we don't need to do cool versus uncool, which is in itself creating a coolness for the audience within of the course. Theater. Okay. Course, yeah. And and once you come to the toilets and you start buying the drugs and you want to go home and get fucked that night, you discover that some people are sexy and everybody wants to sleep with them and other people are grotesquely ugly and nobody wants to sleep with them anyway. And the cool versus some cool thing returns massively anyway. So we, we it's kind of, we can play with it and you kind of do it in a fun, sweet way, but it's sort of me, to me, it's hippie-ish to do it that way because actually you're just pretending that I, we, we can sort of get out of the social side of a while and dance and maybe take a little drug and listen to my music and have help at least for a while, have no social society. But at the end of the day, we're gonna love the social society so much because the social society creates the libido on which we love to fuck and dominate and submit and, and, and do all the things that human beings do. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I always use the word semblance. And that's why I'm really interested in disclosing cool to everybody. That's why I know that a philosophy of cool has to be uncool because it's exposing the occlusion. So once you expose the trick and everyone understands why everyone is pretending to avoid status anxiety, we can all sort of reapproach uh, one another. You know, and sort of the, the trick is, is revealed, and then we can actually maybe better identify the actual shaman. But, but that, that, there's a certain optimism there that I don't share. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here, Thomas. <laughs> so I, I, I Bring certainly it on. agree that this is a good program. Uh, so, exposing this mechanism of, of uh, coolness, especially fake coolness, because it's basically it's a pagan ritual, it, it, it necessarily involves a form of rivalry that is a form of violence. But the problem is, yes, you can reveal that, but that's not necessarily going to help. You might understand perfectly what kind of mimetic hell that you put yourself in, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can get yourself out of it. So these are two different things. So that's why you need religion, basically, right? So religion is nothing else than streamlining the problematic nature of, the, of desire. That, that's all it is. And whether you use paganism or Christianity or Buddhism or psychoanalysis or something else, that's basically what you're doing. So the problem is that just simply explaining people, listen, this is how it works and this is why people are cool. In the end of the day, the cool people, as Alexander probably would say, is the cool people who are going to get, uh, get home with the, with the cool partners. So nothing is going to change. So there's some, there's some deeper 
uh, transformational things that, that that need to be in place. If you, I mean, I, I hear that you're kind of you want to change the world by exposing coup. Is that correct? Just no, I, 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 what I want to do is unmask, demystify the uh, social trajectories of um, of status and the and disintermediate uh, the mediator. So the idea of this mimetic desire being a little bit more lucid for people so that people can more lucidly program themselves. You are a being. hippie. You really are a hippie. Obviously. <laughs> You're being accused of being a hippie here. Uh, <laughs> okay. My point is this. My point is <laughs> you just stated your ambition to be meta cool. So you, you stated your ambition to be cool in the cool by exposing the cool. Yes. You end up in the same game anyway. And, and, and the thing is that Yes, sure. The hier hierarchy is always there and hierarchy returns with a vengeance and there are new hierarchies waiting around the corner. So if, if, you, if you manage, if you successfully manage to sort of get rid of the social society, make everybody relax. This was like the raves in the 1990s. People took the ecstasy, they took ecstasy, MDMA, the whole dance floor was pumping. And after three weeks of that, you couldn't care any longer because you, you discovered that some people were actually ugly and some people were sexy like fuck. And you didn't want to fuck the ugly ones, you wanted to fuck the sexy ones. You wanted to be one of them and you either had to play a game to get them or you had to look great right and you discover okay if sex is a hierarchy and it always is then certainly violence which we try to push down even more which comes back even worse through super super egos and everything is an even stronger force in society that creates hierarchy so the hierarchy is everywhere this hierarchy of information this hierarchy of knowledge they're the people who are in they're the people who are out they're those who know the codes they're those who never were taught the codes they're sure. those who never get the codes and they're of course they're the best scapegoats you could possibly find because they're so stupid but, but the hierarchies, you know, kill, the hierarchies right? are different than in 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 they're not animal hierarchies because animal hierarchies are typically uh, structured along very simple things you know like yes. strength Human hierarchies are very are very strange because they, they are they are created by this mimetic mechanism. So they you shouldn't think of them in too simple terms. They're not just like very simple hierarchies where competent people are at the top. And that's not how it works. I mean, the the the, the default um, anthropology of, of humanity, if you follow Girard, which I obviously do, then is that that these hierarchies that we see they are they are they are they're based on, on mimesis, on, on this triangle of structure. And that means there's, there's all, all kinds of strange hierarchies going on that, are, that don't necessarily involve skills, that don't necessarily involve anything except empty prestige. So people go into deep, deep competition for... for you, can, you can look at the, the, the current conflict between Israel and, and Palestine is a good example of a conflict that is not about any object anymore. That, that these two countries are fighting about, but it's, it's very clear it's that the conflict itself is sustained because that indicates that there is some kind of object which is undefined that both parties want. But in this case, they've forgotten the object and they, they've just basically become focused on the conflict itself because conflict always uh, indicates that there is, is an, a, a very valuable object of desire. So this is the same thing in, in sadomasochism, right? In sadomasochism, you create this sadomasochist situation, and it's the rivalry, it's the conflict, it's the pain, it's the prohibition that creates a virtual object. It doesn't exist, but just the fact that this structure is there indicates a situation that you want to want to expose yourself to because you have this virtual object that you want to be close to. So these ki kinds of 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 uh, these kinds of tendencies are, 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 are going on in humans. And, and you need to understand this, that this is going on. Otherwise, you will never understand why people do all this bizarre stuff that people do. And, and probably also to understand yourself a bit. Well, just to, to defend Ebert here, I think he's, he's exposing the, 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 the scapegoat mechanism a little bit. By, yeah, by, I, by, I, by, I, by showing that the humor and the ridiculousness of and, and, and being self-aware of, of the cool and what the cool is and what it is and not just not just playing the game in a, in a blind kind of. But you're not going to you're kind of not going to get rid of these hierarchies. And I think this is the tantric attitude. Right. So. So. Uh -huh. uh, so, Ebert, you, you had this idea. I'm going to expose what what is cool. And that, that's very useful because you're probably going to expose a lot of fake cool. Right. That's great. But at the end of the day. This is just how it, how the world works. You are going to have a mimetic desire. You're going to turn people into either teachers, obstacles, or rivals, or you don't care about them. That's the options you have. 
That's it. And that's not going to change. That's fundamental human nature. But what you can do is you're going to say, well, I'm going to study desire very, very carefully, and I'm going to learn how to use it in a constructive way, whatever, how mm. you want to define constructive, right? I, I'm going to use it in a skillful way. And that's, that's the tantric attitude, basically. So and I think the study of desire is... We're is going to really study, study it, and we're going to learn how to use it, essentially. Sorry to interrupt, but that really struck me that... I'm used study to it. The study of desire is, is kind of the study, what we're talking about here. In, in yeah, sense. that that's what we call transcendence, Jan Sadekis and I. So it's different from desire and drive in the sense that it's the desire that is conscious of its own desire. So You got desire, you got desire figured out, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, say, what is lacking in Jacques Lacan is that Jacques Lacan never discusses what a successful analysant has gone through Lacan analysis would actually think of the world, including himself. So once you've figured out how desire works, you're not gonna go and kill yourself, obviously, although you understand you could do that, but once you figure that out, you will both be slave to our desires because you can't be anything else, but you're still conscious of it and you will therefore behave differently. And that is what we call transcendence. Transcendence cannot be anything except for that. It, so in a way, transcendence is meta desire where desire is meta drive and drive is meta instinct. That's the way we, we look at them when, they, when they all, we have the whole spectrum all four, instinct, drive, desire, and transcendence in our work. And, and cool ties into that, yeah. It, it's always the next layer, at least, obviously, visible to you. So you, there's a certain cool, obviously, that a lot of people miss out on, but the people who are in the know, who are cool themselves, know what's really cool. So cool can also be hierarchy, certainly. And for those who don't want to be publicly, you know, recognized, which most same people do not, because they don't want to be members of a freak show, then they are perfectly happy these days to be subculturally cool if they are within a very small environment. And that also makes it easier for them to stay in the cool state. Because that's obviously a lot easier, the fewer people you have to tend to, and the more focused you can be on what you really want to do. Trying to appeal to the masses is in itself no longer cool and cannot be. That's exactly what we call it, freak shows, right? I'm interested yeah, also in the, like, like uh, al alchemically. The the evil eye. I mean, that's what in Turkey, you know, you have these, these eyes. I mean, that's to protect yourself from the eye of the mob, to be in the center of the attention. No, you know, this is very dangerous. The only people, you know, people who are in the center of attention, they're, they're either kings or scapegoats. And kings are nothing else than po postponed scapegoats. Being in the center of attention has been very, very dangerous for, for a long time for humanity. And it's probably going to become uh, more and more dangerous in the future. That's really interesting. That means the king will now retract. That means the only people left be recognized well, the by the masses the are the scapegoats. The king doesn't no. want to be there in the first place. The king doesn't no. want to be there. Kings, That's kings right. don't want to be there. I mean, people like no. uh, Xi Jinping in China and stuff like I mean, imagine being that person. You can't just say like, oh, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go to the Riviera and relax. And I mean, these people actually, they, they, they are kind of summoned. They have the Damocles sword over their head at all times. Right? That's the characteristic yeah. of the king. Yeah, but I would say now that the kings are the scapegoats. So that's the point of cool. The point of cool is that asymmetry provides the kingship and that we, we want that asymmetry. There's, there's an idea in transactional analysis called strokes. You want positive strokes, ideally, but you'll take negative strokes because the worst thing is no strokes. The worst thing is not being acknowledged. So a positive stroke, you're walking down the street, some, you, you wave at someone, someone waves back. Okay, they recognize my existence. Negative stroke, you wave at someone, they look at you and they're like, fuck you. It's a negative stroke, but they recognize you. You get, you get existence. Neg a, a zero stroke is you wave at somebody, they say nothing, they ignore you. And transactional analysis and Eric Byrne and the whole you know, transactional analysis apparatus Posit, and I think it's true that we'll take negative strokes if we can't get positive strokes. They're, no, they're I think, I, no, I, no, no. I think the vast majority of smart people, they don't take strokes at all. They don't care. They walk past you. No. They're not part of their tribe. They no. don't care. Optimistic. No. They don't care. No, no, I, 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 listen, 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 I am a celebrity. I think you're the only person I know, Alexander, who doesn't care. I mean, exactly. But hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. I've been there. Okay, <laughs> yeah, ask a Swede or Alexander Bardis. They probably have an idea who I am. So uh, having been there and knowing how empty it is, uh, it's just the emptiest place in the world to be and I'm not interested. And that's how actually I started looking at, are there other people who would have the same experience? Yeah, either those who figure that out or those who share the same experience would come to the same point. So I don't think you can say the king is a scapegoat because the kings are no longer around. There are no kings. 
We live sure, currently the king- in a state where there are no kings. Nobody wants to be king. Nobody wants to be a politician. Nobody wants to be a celebrity. And when nobody wants to be a celebrity, what do you do? You bring in the reality TV shows, stars, and what are they? Scapegoats. Every one of them is the next celebrities scapegoat. Celebrities are, are torn kings. apart. Celebrities yeah. are That's the kings. point. It's yeah. the same thing. Celebrities, celebrities are scapegoats, yeah. And you see in, in celebrities, you know, they're, they're super, super famous and then they're forgotten or they get into a, into a scandal and everybody turns against them. That's typical for the king. The king is always in, in danger of being killed when things go wrong. That's why you have a king. Yeah, you but know, kings... let, let him lead. And then you know that you know who you're going to kill. We, we all know who's going to die when it goes wrong. That means that you are safe. The king is exposed and can be killed. So that's you're fragile or whatever, part, right? as opposed to anti-fragile. Of the, of the connection between the, the sacrificial mechanism and, and kings. Kings are nothing else than scapegoats. Yes, but kings are also made by, be, by being scapegoats. Donald Trump was a scapegoat. Uh, Marilyn Manson was a scapegoat. You become a scapegoat to achieve the kingly status. And I guess that's the point. Yeah. Yes, so first, uh, to the, so what Girard, uh, what Girard um, um, explains is that basically, so, so they, these were often scapegoats were kept, you know, like the Greek, Greek civilization, right? The, those cultured uh, Greeks, they actually kept slaves that they killed in pagan rituals when things went wrong, right? So they were called the pharmacons, I believe. And um, so, so, so if you keep slaves like that, right, in order to be sacrificed, some of these slaves make them, made themselves popular. So and they were worshipped before they were sacrificed. And so there's a yeah. natural, there's a natural mm-hmm. gradual change from a classic, classic scapegoat to a king. And in many, many tribes, you can see that the kings, they're kept for a couple of years and then they're killed, you know, when something goes wrong or they're even regularly killed. You know that when you're a king, in two years, you will be killed. But I guess I wonder if Gerard is, is, uh, uh, addresses the idea that the reason they become popular is because we start to desire their asymmetry. We start to de- desire their scapegoatism. Yeah, well, you're, you're quite right about the asymmetry because it's the eye of the mob versus the, the scapegoated individual, right? There's, a, there's the building that, that's in the Bible. It says like it's the building block that's rejected and that's going to build the house. On yes. that building block, the house will be constructed. Very yeah. strange sentence in the Bible. Girard gives it a very, very clear explanation. It's because the, the culture is structured around the scapegoat, right? So that's, that's the beginning of culture. So you're right. It's an asymmetry. It's the, it's the eye of the mob. It's the evil eye versus that individual. And sometimes it's the king who kind of who kind of manages to kind of dance with that evil eye. And sometimes very, very long. But yeah. it's always a very dangerous position to put yourself in. Also sure. As a, Sure, sure. Howard Stern, there's innumerable examples of people who intentionally scapegoat themselves to achieve the king status. Yes, yes, yes. That That's the, uh, uh, you remind me of why Sedeclis and I will not use the word king in the new book. We decided to go for chief versus priest because sure. otherwise these roles are mixed up. The way you use the word king, I subscribe to that. So I should say that, by the way, because I, I, I thought of king previously as, as chief, but that was my mistake. I just want to correct that. Yeah, I, I totally sense. subscribe I mean, there, to what there you are, said. There are, of course, there are of course, so, so there is, so mimesis is not always negative, right? So you have obstacles, big problem that leads to de- depression. Then you have, uh, you have rivals. I mean, that can lead to neurosis and things like that. Um, but you also, of course, have models, right? So teachers, people who teach you something. So you admire them and you copy them, uh, and but, you... but you don't go into rivalry or you don't turn them into obstacles. So these are the people that you want to have around you. And that's the kind of person that you want to be. And so, so one of the things that just, just a very simple practice that's every time you do something, right? It's like, how is that person going to perceive me as a model, as an obstacle, as a rival, or as something that is of no importance whatsoever? Because these are the four options that you have, right? This is interesting because there, there could be then um, a kingly cool versus a priestly cool here in the sense that the priest has to be around. So the priest performs, it's obviously a shame with the dress, performs to then leave, reside in the temple or outside the outside culture uh, mm. to stay around. Uh, so there's, there's this longevity to it, whereas the kings are actually thrown in the center and they're then being scapegoated whenever somebody needs to be blamed. So like the ultimate sacrifice is the young king or something like that. Would that make any sense? So, so uh, if there's a cool attached to these two characters, the different types of cool, one is more low key, Yes. And last longer. And the other yeah. one is more intense, but let's, overdone with quicker. Let's look at David Bowie real quick. He was imitating others. He was imitating. He got his shit from like, you know, New York dolls, other people. Right. And they were more they, they, they didn't create as much salience. And then he gets all this credit for being like, you know, he's sort of the kingly cool. They were the priestly cool or just like transvestites on the street where the where the priestly cool, whatever, whatever the inspiration was. 
And I think that, you know, I think that that's a worthwhile thing to look at is that there still exists an actual cool to come back to the cool as awesome. There exists a strata that like, you know, we can defend, but in the sense of the, the aspirations for status in the context of status, and some people really don't care about status. Bard, you're one of them, right? So you don't care about status, you're priestly cool, right? And then someone else comes along and they're Bard 2.0 and they're kingly cool and they're much more famous. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this would be sort of the difference. And you're like, fuck them. They're not the real thing, right? Um, and I think that, you know, by the way, Bard, you extol your asymmetry all the time, right? You talk about how you don't, you're glad you're not popular. You're not popular for a reason. You know why you're not popular popular in the sort of macro sense, right? You have your cult following. And that's important because it almost signifies your veracity. It almost corroborates that you're doing something worthwhile. Yeah, I, I, I was very, very, very much celebrity in a small country. So what I could do arriving in Sweden here some you know, 30 years ago was that I realized that, okay, but if I have a career here, I can have one career here and I can have another career internationally. Because the problem is if you break it in America, you have everybody watching. You cannot avoid that. America has decided that we're the whore of the world and everybody has to watch everything we do and be part of everything we do. And that's essentially the world to us Americans, right? So sitting outside America, you discover that Amer we know everything about America outside America, but America doesn't know shit about the world outside of America. So it's, kind of, it's kind of a weird glass house to look into. And then you discover that one of the benefits of that is that in America, yes, you can really go for a subcultural credibility, which you try to do by not going too mainstream. You try to avoid mm -hmm. that. You play a little more jazz than you do pop, and therefore you can have a longer career. And yeah, because you probably also will be a better musician in the process, be more uncompromising. You will keep your cool much longer. So that, 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 that is when you can go into the sort of priestly cool we're talking about here. But what I could do was that I could just realize I can be one person in Russia, one in Germany, one in Sweden, one in, one in America, because the other three are not connected to America itself, which is the top of the information hierarchy. So if I don't try to get to the top of the information hierarchy, if I'm just popular in gay discos in America or something like that, I can actually be cool with the Kurt Cobains of the world and hang out with them, but I don't <laughs> yeah. have to be the number one guy in the charts that they all want to kill next week. Sure. I can yeah, be yeah. number 23 and I you can have a much good... longer career, and, but I can then, like I did, because it was international, I went back to Sweden and became this horrible TV star who did Idol and, and ta got talent and all those shows until I finally last year gave up wearing a chicken collar costume on the last show and said, no more of this. I mean, never more an autograph to a family with kids or anything. It's just over. It's just, I'm not doing it ever again. I want to go into the realm of philosophy and here I can afford not to care. And I can afford to be completely uncompromising and do this sort of crappy podcast that we're doing right now and talk about the things that I'm, I love, right? Right. Yeah, that's, it reminds me of something I used to notice when I was first going on tour, which is uh, in the you know early 2000s. Uh, celebrities here still did not um, advertise themselves uh, uh, in association with products for the most part in America. But you go over to Europe, they're everywhere. You go to Japan, they're fucking everywhere. Billboards, some of this, some of that, wear these glasses. And it was amazing because there was this stigma in the United States that you shouldn't do that, that you would lose your cool if you associated yourself with capitalism. And of course that's changed. And I think one of the, you know, an interesting little side note that changed in about 2000. And I think the reason was 2000 was when Napster came and musicians who are generally the vanguard of cool suddenly couldn't earn as much money with their shit. So they started having to succumb back to sort of the Medici and minstrelize themselves in the courts. Of the oh, I love this. We should always yeah. have a period of prostitution thrown into uh, any hurricane, you know, <laughs> sure. yeah. because it's good for you. So you get back to the roots again and stop being, uh, you know. yeah, stop being so that's pure. true. That's what happened. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But what's I, interesting about that to me is that now, you know, where's the ethics in all this? And, and where is the cool you used to have this ethic? It was called selling out. And we don't have it anymore. Right. For the most part, kids, they want uh, the Doritos laced uh, demi glaze. They want the fucking ironic uh, Coca-Cola woke shirt. There's no discernment between uh, 
total attentionless saturation and asymmetry. And it's really interesting. It's actually something, a problem I'm trying to work out in the age of attentionalism. I'm not sure how that figures, but- Oh, I, I can tell you where that is. It's the influencer whore. She's the total sellout these days. So what happens is that you got this young girl and she does clothes and she's classy and she's beautiful. All the guys want to fuck her and she gets popular, right? And she has taste. She has a couple of good gay friends too, probably. And she then runs uh, her stuff online, social media, and she gets very uh, successful. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, but you need to monetize your business, darling. And that's when the capitalist walks through the door, right? And she's a tensionalist until that point. And suddenly, but she has no money, right? So the capitalist comes in and says, but why don't you wear these ugly clothes? Uh, but they're ugly, they're not my taste, you know? Yeah, but we sort of cover them up and we fool your fans into believing you actually like them because then we can pay you. And she becomes a whore, which is different from a prostitute, right? And that's what the kids are discovering now. They're discovering the 2010s, which is like, everybody was a fucking sellout. But mm. this time it was really for sure. real sellouts, right? Sure, because they did all... sell out their attentional value, not capital value, to in return sure. for financial capital. And that's, and of course, they burn out no time at all. They become the sort of, they scapegoated instantly. They just, they have the very short careers these days. I just remind young, I did this TikTok star thing with this TikTok star who's like hysterical the other day. And it's like a hundred thousand views in an hour or whatever. And I'm like Gandalf with a stick because I'm like this old man who hardly knows the kids any longer. I'm not on TikTok, right? But I did the conversation with him because he had this enormous charisma and he was very frank and outspoken. And that's what I liked about him. He said all the things you must not say. Totally politically incorrect. That's what the kids loved about him. And I just pointed out why he was successful and, and, and basically told them, yeah, it's refreshing that you're around. And this is how it works and how it's repeated again and again. But don't sell out. You know what he told me? He said, the only people I sell out to are, are cocaine dealers from Colombia. And I said, good one. That's a good one. That's the best way to take capitalism. And the last part of the capitalism is to make money from cocaine dealers in Colombia who are politically totally incorrect and pick up the last man of capitalism and then have money in your bank account and say, I got fuck off money. Now I can be completely intentionalist to say what I want the rest of my life. I think that's what young people are looking for today. Have that perfect option to squeeze capitalism, the last little juice out of it for your own sake. So you could then go out and say, listen, I'm free. Mm. I have fuck off money. I don't need more money than I have the rest of my life. So I can now gladly endorse myself in all the things that I want to do or with the people that I want to work with. And that is attentionalist value. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, mainstream was so lampooned that now the mainstream itself almost is this sort of like uh, attentional asymmetry, suffers from like this attentional asymmetry. So I know a lot of hipsters, really hip fucking kids, young kids that love mainstream shit intentionally and ironically, because even though it is the sort of dominant force, cool has bastardized it to the extent that now it's recuperated itself. And um, yeah, yeah that's, why I call it, that's why I call cool dialectical. So yeah. norm core, things like that. Sure, and, sure, exactly. and, and always look out for the gay guys because the gay guys are the first ones to probably get yeah. tired. Like if you want to hear people who are sick or woke right now, it's gay guys, right? So you go to gay party and say, yeah, we work for all these women and these women want to design their own dresses. And we know what it's like when women design dresses, they're boring. You know, they should ask us to design the dresses because we would start a bomb, make them sexy again so their men want to fuck them. But we'll have to wait another few years until women discover that they don't want their own clothes any longer. They will ask us to do it again. So they, they figured it out, right? Meanwhile, they do all the campaigns and try to dress it up and try to make it look more glamorous than it actually is. So, yeah, they, they are cool now in response to the sort of mainstream, totally commercialized, bland, woke shit. That is mainstream culture at the moment. Let's see, let's see what the dialectical turn comes next in relation to that. That we don't know. And of course we can't know because that's what I call the pathical element where the 50 year old says to his mom, I will not do what you expect me to do because then I will not be cool and I will not be able to get away from my mom and be liberated. Right. So I got a question about, about cool, about that I maybe changing the, the subject a little bit. Uh, cool always seems it seems to me to be a it's like an al al alchemical mixture of hot and cold it's 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 always an in between state it's always a little bit androgynous it's always a bit little snaky and and it's neither masculine or feminine it's something in between um, so 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 why is that and and you know 
Didn't you just describe shamanic? And in that case, you said that's shamanic. Yeah, yeah. that's shamanic. That's that's shamanic. You just described, and it's it's shape shifting, and and it's it's being able to be the the hero with a thousand faces or the the multiple beings or something like that. Yeah, uh, Andrew, you pointed you pointed out that on IDW, right? So so the shape shifting, the hero with a thousand faces. That basically, if you want to be cool, you'd better know how to change from one moment to the other because that's the only way that you will keep that up. And the second thing is that why are, are cool people after androgynous? Well, that's because they provide their own feminine or masculine side to themselves. Mm. Yeah. So again, they need to constantly project, I have this, I have no lack. You lack, you want stuff. You're not happy with who you are. But I am happy, completely happy, completely together the way I am. So but that is, of course, an illusion, right? So it's an illusion that you... So I think that this is something that is maybe a bit underestimated here. The person who is cool doesn't like himself. The person mm-hmm. who's cool doesn't like herself. And the person who thinks that that person is cool, they don't like themselves either. And they need each other to keep that construction going. That's the whole point of it. Because you need to kind of project like I don't lack. While on the inside, you're really working hard to give this effortless performance. It looks effortless from the outside, not from the inside. And wait, can, you're but then when it's right, shamanistic, it is oh, effortless, wait. right? Like, like when it becomes truly yes, but, shamanistic, but it's, it really. really is effortless. No, 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 no. no. I mean, not cool. effortless. Like you don't make an effort. Andrew, wait. Can, can not, I just uh, can contrived. I just tell you what 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 Thomas just said? Uh, I believe Thomas is absolutely right. But there is an exception. There are people who are cool by doing the same thing all over and over and over again because the people around them change too often, too much, and too nervous about it. Oh, that's true. So yeah. have, again, have entire true. careers of artists. Yes. Who, Mm-hmm. They, yes. they were French. They were French singers who would always woke up in a black dress with one light on and sing. And yes. every time they would walk on stage, people would go, "Maybe she'll wear a purple dress this time, or a green dress, or just change." And and, and they would wait, wait, wait. And suddenly the singer would woke up in another black dress, the same black dress every time. And that would be cool mm-hmm. because it's all dialecticals. It depends on the situation. Mm-hmm. But Thomas is onto something really interesting here. There is something deeply. Unsatis- self unsatisfying about the coolness, which I think it's actually the core to cool. I think that is key. There's something unfinished. There's something, there's a deep void. The, 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 the exuberance of void in the cool. The cool is not complete in any way whatsoever. Is it dissatisfaction it's, it's, or is it it's like? No, it's very human. It's very human. It's, it's very sort of, it's, well, it's very otherwise, practical. Otherwise like like I'm, I'm both hiding on the stage. I'm hiding something, but at the same time, for those who know it's obvious. Right. So it's like for those in the audience who know what I'm doing, uh, it's obvious. I don't even know if it's obvious to them, but it'll be so obvious because the coolness works. Yeah. Can I can I say well, that kind of a deadly vulnerability there or something or like this killer vulnerability or something to the. But I can, can I bring can I bring it back to yeah. attention? It when you keep changing or you do something different, it indicates a desire for attention, does it not? And then we can bring this back to attentionalism. Now, for instance, you said, if you do the same thing over and over, it can be cool, so long as everybody else is changing. Again, the law of social asymmetry. So I wore this shirt you may, <laughs> for the Cadell thing yesterday, right? And I'm, I woke up, I'm fu- or whenever that was, Saturday. And I woke up, I'm like, okay, I better change my shirt. Nah, you know what? Fuck that. Everybody else changes all their shit. And so that everyone's making fun of everyone. Oh, he's wearing the same shirt. So I'm going to wear the exact same fucking outfit. Fuck you. Right. So there's my social asymmetry. So I am deeply dissatisfied with whatever and, this, and some order. And obviously I want to sort of be either a permissionary. There's two, two ways to go about this. And I think one is better than the other. A permissionary where I give other people permission. Hey, you know what? You can also dress the same every day. But after you start doing that, because I'm dissatisfied with myself, I'll start dressing different. But for now, I'll give you permission to do what I'm doing. And then as soon as you all are doing it, I'll change. And that's yeah. like suffering from this vanguard. So by, by, by the time you get there, the Zoom doesn't smell T-shirt is no longer cool because that's exactly what we were creating. Right? <laughs> that's true. Zoom doesn't smell. <laughs> Zoom but doesn't but you're right. But this was my point. We talked about before the calculation. What looks in hindsight like it could be calculated and probably can in hindsight cannot be calculated beforehand. So my point here is that it's precisely the sort of waiting to know what you're going to do next and being a bit surprised about your own behavior. Sure. That's probably when you're closest to cool, if you're ever mm. aware of it. It's probably when you're just like, 
No, fuck that shit. Uh, I'll wear the same shirt. And by the way, who the fuck cares of all the 500 or 600 people who watch both these two podcasts who are, by the way, you know, totally fantastically weird. So it's... it's but, but you're still, you're, I feel like what you're describing is aura, like, like back to Walter Benjamin. I feel like what you're describing is the idea of something that is awesome, right? Something that is lightning in a bottle. You can't capture it. You can't predict it. But me with this shirt... Immediately, I'm like, you know, you can predict, like, and I, I, I skate, I'm scapegoating myself, right? With this shirt by wearing it twice because whatever, in some minimal. Well, well you, but listen, listen, you don't even know when people react to the shirt thing. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. Do you? Yes, of course. Every, people are going to be like, he's wearing the same. I, of course. You mean we have so many nervous Portland hipsters that are watching this episode so they would actually. No, but <laughs> if they were. Because I know that society, generally speaking, really values change up and change in shirts. And like fashion is all about dis like uh, 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 you could throw it away, wear the next thing. Anytime any celebrity, by the way, wears the same thing, it's fucking news. So and so comes out in the same dress. Oh, my God. So I'm just saying like, I got nothing better to talk thing. about than that. That's exactly when it starts getting uncool. <laughs> exactly. I'm not cool. You don't understand. <laughs> I don't want to be cool. That's the whole point. He's protesting. So you're still conflating cool with aura. No, I, I, I try to use cool in a smart neutral. Well, what's the difference between cool and aura? I don't, I don't get it. Aura is this thing that's lightning in a bottle where people are like, ah, oh my that's God, it's the cool, inspiration. Cool it's the is. moment of what's that? That's all what cool is. It's just... But if you convince somebody that you don't like well, it, a person is I think I, I, I don't have to do this with you, Hamilrick, because you, you're not conflating them. But most people, cool is a synthome that is unanalyzable and that they're completely stuck with. And it means aura. It means awesome. And it's very difficult to disambiguate. But somebody might think, oh, you know, Egbert, he's, he's so cool because he doesn't he doesn't. Change his right. shirt. Like, I'm, I'm he, playing my own game. Doesn't give right. a shit. He's really I'm, a real. He's a real individual. We're actually you. Not, you did that intentionally. You know, like you did. Yeah, it. because I'm uncool, I become cool. Un, whatever is uncool becomes cool, literally. Like, like. Well, there's like, another aspect there, right? Because if you break the rules, right, then then you create a. You, so normally you're in the space of sutra, right? So let's generalize. Ah, sutra, sutra, yeah. Sutra, sutra is the, the rules rules right yeah. so the moment you start breaking the rules so that's a bit what you're describing right so then then people immediately move to some kind of dionysian energy this mm -hmm. is the, the, the space of the ritual if mm -hmm. the rules don't apply anymore then you're in a ritual space and this is of yeah. course that's why rock and roll is so outrageous why is rock and roll why are they always misbehaving they're misbehaving because they want to make sure that people know we're not in the realm of tantra of sutra anymore where we've moved in another realm in a ritual realm mm -hmm. a dionysian realm a pagan mm -hmm. realm Mm -hmm. So there's another aspect there, right? And that that yeah. kind of conflates with cool as well. So that, that's, that's another yeah. aspect. And, and, and to bring all of, all, all of us together, my thing is ritual tradition. Your thing is Tantra Sutra. Your thing is process event, right? And they're all the same thing. One, one is the, the, the flare up or, or the distortion and the other is the compression. The other is the repetition, the redundancy of that initial flare. Mm -hmm. You know, and the idea is that we all want to think that we're always in ritual. Well, some of them. Process is sutric because it's repetitive, and and then tantra is 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 the event because it's 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 a moment of of uh, revelation or or um, transgression or. Is that what you're I'll, saying? I'll, I'll be careful here though because process and event is actually historical. These are historical concepts, and tantra sutra doesn't have to be at all. So Thank tantra you. and sutra mm -hmm. are hierarchical. Sutra is what you can handle to a certain point that we run society based on the fact that people can commit themselves to sutra and follow sutric law. So for example, that, that's how society operates. Otherwise we would have gone extinct a long time ago. And Tantra is then the possibility to uh, understand why the rules of the laws are there so you can actually cross them over and you can, you, you can commit yourself in, that, in, the, in that, that space. That could certainly happen in nomadic society, but you cannot have process an event in nomadic society at all. Nomadic society can only be processed and nothing else. It's the eternal repetition of the same. It could not, you could not imagine the event in nomadic society. You have to settle first and you have to accumulate information, accumulate resources to actually be able to think the event at all. So that's where they're different. Sorry, so explain this to me again. So, so, so sort of like a Marxist version of the dialectic where you have to accumulate enough stuff and then an event happens and there's a qualitative shift. 
Okay, so the first time anybody thought event was Zoroaster in Persia 3,700 years ago. It's not even the Indians or the Chinese thought about it prior to that. So the, 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 the idea is that the son can create a world that's different from the father, radically different, because technological change has occurred and information has been accumulated and there's knowledge written down that will not die with you when you die. So for the first time, we can actually think that something will survive me. Okay. My knowledge can survive me. And that is the accumulation of information. And from that, Zoroaster makes the distinction that there are people who are not permanent to settle, there are people who are still nomadic. I sure. will side with those permanent to settle for the very simple reason that they're an event. They've sure. decided to do something differently, and that in itself is worth defending. Sure. Otherwise, there will be no point. I'm not a moralist. He wasn't a moralist at all. He just basically said, here's an event. Events differ from a process. You should allow to give the event a chance and therefore create a world of events rather than a world of only process. So you either have a world of, of process or a world of process and event. The mistake I claim that Christianity and Islam are struggling with is that they tried to create an eventology without the process. And that is the problem. So that's essentially the way you look at process and event. So Tantra and Sutra are another axis altogether. I would say Tantra and Sutra is just on what level, or what, what, where in the hierarchy of knowledge are you right now? What are you, and that's exactly why we can only handle certain Tantras. So Tantras, we have a talent for handling and where we're at a point in life, we actually were capable of actually handling them. They're different part absolute. So you cannot handle all of Tantra or anything like that. Although the priests obviously desire to, to know it all, and no matter how tough the truth is, I want to know it all. This, these were the Zervanites in Persia. These were the Sadokites among, among, among the Jews. These were the priests who desired to, no matter how hard the truth is, I will want the truth, but I will want it only for myself challenging myself to be able to handle it, knowing that the vast majority of people could never, ever handle the truth. It occurs sure. to me that Christ Christianity is like the most, and probably Islam as well, are the most uncool religions. Like Judaism is super cool, you know, to, you know the, the Jews are, have so many cool people. I mean, I, I wonder why that is. I wonder- Because Islam and Christianity missionize. They they want everybody to become a Muslim or a Christian. It's the easiest thing in the world to become a Muslim. It, uh -huh. it's, easy, it's like joining Facebook. It's just like, sign here, you're in. Okay, yeah. and you get to go to heaven when you die. Because cool and has to be then, the, then, has to be this I, I'm not, I, I'm word absolute. I'm dialogue with Muslims and Christians. The problem with Islam and Christianity is that they're both based on the assumption that they should go for the quantity. They should have as many followers as possible. They were designed that way. They were designed to be mass religions. That could yeah. also be the beauty, but that's the problem. That. Well, but there's one to talk philosophy and theology. <laughs> Alexander, that becomes Alexander, from Alexander, that's what every citric religion tries to do because this is yeah. the, the default set of prohibitions that everybody should follow because the alternative is uh, mimetic escalation, uh, escalation of rivalry, war of all against all, and annihilation of the tribe. So sutric religions are per definition mass religions. They should be accepted to a great extent by everybody. You're not going to kill, you know, monogamy and stuff like that so that you remove, you remove all these problems that come from, uh, from violence and especially revenge killing and you remove the problems that come from, from uh, sexuality. Because, not because of sexuality in itself, but because of the rivalry that comes with sexuality. If you can figure out your sexuality without rivalry, you can do whatever you want. But, but if, you let it, just, if you just let it run rampant, then you will have conflict everywhere. So sutric religions need to be adopted by a, a large amount of people because like, it's like, you know, we're not going to kill you. We're not going to do these obvious things that everybody agrees on. That's why sutric religions need to be mass religions to some extent. Yeah, and that's where they're centered on, on top of that. Yeah, they're centered on husband, wife, and child, and things like that, too. They're yes, very similar. You know, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and if, if, if the Jews saw Christianity as a sort of attempt at universalizing their religion, they, the Zoroastrians saw Islam as an attempt at universalizing their religion. That's why you have these four, the quadrant of the four coming out of the Middle East. What I'm saying, though, is that Nietzsche says, exactly like you, in such a religion, if that's gone, we're in havoc, right? That's yes, apocalyptic, exactly, yeah. right there. That's yeah. what Nietzsche says. But what I'm saying is that we also, pay in parallel with that, we have to have this sort of noble discussion today on what do we actually know? And at least in these smaller circuits, philosophical, theological circuits, we have an understanding that certain things have become obvious to us. So the, the bar absolute was no longer there. We saw too much of truth. We saw too much of the inside of the temple. Now yeah, we've got to live with that. That gene is out of the bottle. And that's what I'm struggling with. Prohibitions, 
It's you, the, the, yes. new, the emergence of new technology requires the emergence of new prohibitions. And it, that's where we are at the moment with AI and digital, the internet, the internet of things on the way, causality, AI on the way. So that means that, that our technology is forcing us to come up with new prohibitions. So this is what Nietzsche called, you know, the, uh, what is the, uh, the new values and things like that. So, so I think that's that's. I, I call I call it Aristotle. Crisis. Yeah. The meaning crisis is basically like, well, the prohibitions that worked 20 years ago, we don't want them anymore. They seem irrelevant. We need to update them. How are we going to do that? This is what we call the Aristotelian Renaissance or Aristotelian revival in our work. To give Aristotle credit for that, because that's where it starts from. That that's what they, it it is it is that it, it is understanding incredibly complex systems and how they collaborate with one another and therefore construct proper barred absolute within those systems. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right on that one. The other thing I think about Mark Stallman who came up with the term actually, so we should credit him for actually coming up with the term. With what term? Aristotelian revival or Aristotelian renaissance. Oh, he's, he's, uh, that's like Aquinas, right? Yeah. So, funny, uh, yeah. I funny. do, like I do. people know what, what, so this is the core philosopher of the Catholic Church, right? It's Aquinas. I mean, this is nothing like what people think about Christianity, right? None of these things that you think about Christianity, well, you know, when I die, I go to heaven, all those stuff. This is not what the Catholic Church believes at all. <laughs> This is like kind of mind boggling, you know, this is like all of these things that people think Christianity is like that. No. Yeah, and Orthodox Christianity. Well, popular Christianity. Orthodox Christianity, and Orthodox and Christianity is, is also completely different from Catholicism, right? That's uh, Christus Victor. That's very close to Girard. Actually, Orthodox Christianity seems to be the, the popular Christianity now in the West. So I got friends who become uh, became Orthodox Christians, and that seems to work very well. And Orthodox Christianity goes back to the anthropology of Girard, essentially. So, yeah, I'll be right back. P break. Great conversation, but yeah. I think I think I think we've only we only started uh, scratching the surface of a philosophical cool, and I still like to put the framework for me is essentialism and the exploration of essentialism and, and what that could possibly mean, and I would I would love to put the philosophical cool in in there as well. Mm. I think Girard wrote so much about this, you know, the, the coquettes, uh, which Freud wrote about, about uh, the, the woman who seems unreachable. And he found it very fascinating and tried to explain it and stuff like that. It's very simple, this, this you know, if, if somebody, so the, the ultimate relationship, the most passionate relationship that you can have is the relationship with somebody who, who ignores you completely. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. that person has the ultimate object of desire. So that person has something that is so valuable that you're completely shielded away from it. That's often the that, case. That's what generates of... stalking. That generates well, then, stalking. Then you get, you, yeah. get totally, <laughs> you get totally obsessed. That's the, so, so that's stalking. why you like the, the, Yeah, the stalking. Ultimate, uh... Stalking is exactly that. That's what stalking yeah. is. Stalking yeah. and devotion and religion. Um, you know, make it, as, make it as inaccessible as possible and then people will want it. And, and yes. It. Yeah. Yes. But it's, that's sadomasochism, right? It's, a, it's that stance. Ebert, do you have do you have stalkers, Ebert? We're talking about stalking and, and yeah. the ultimate object of desire being the desire that completely ignores you. Yes, of course. Of course. And that's occlusion again. The glasses suddenly, instead of a suppress uh, 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 a state of uh, of demeaning oneself, uh, you know, uh, suddenly by occlusion, the more I occlude uh, my stalkers, the worse it gets. The that's more the desire sense. ramps up. You know, and um, a guy knocked on my door uh, a couple of years ago at 3 a.m. It's like, you know, I didn't answer. This is a fun story, actually, just as a side note. I didn't answer. I'm like, who is it? He's like, hey, is Alex Ebert there? I was like, uh, come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. I'll meet you in the park. So I meet him in the park and he's going and he's like, do you believe in angels? And I was like, well, you know, uh, what are you talking about? Tell me what you're talking about. He's like, well, I think that I'm uh, St. Germain and you are uh, St. Michael or, or whatever. And, um, and I think that Trump is, no, Trump is St. Germain and it's our job to convince him. I was like, okay, this is, but this is in 2016 leading up to the election. I was like, look, I tried to talk him sort of down a little bit. And he sends me a, a message later says, are you ready for the Splatten in Manhattan? And right before one of their, uh, one of their uh, debates, I was like, oh my God, this guy, is this guy gonna kill somebody? Now he lives a couple hours away he can show up at my house anytime. And now there's this other sort of thing that's popped up on social media by a guy named, named Michael, which I think may also be him. 
And so, you know, you are so sweet. You actually see your stalkers and talk to them. Well, it's an interesting I call the thing. Police. The more, the more, yeah, sure. And maybe I should just call the, poli the police, but the more, you know, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult equation. But um, I wanted to talk about antilogy real quick, which is the inversion of meaning and contronym. And you said Christianity is not cool, but it is cool when it's in antilogy. So when you have suddenly goth, right? When you have the inversion, when you have an anti-mimesis. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, life is imitating art, which was Oscar Wilde's idea of anti-mimesis, but rather anti-mimesis in the sense that, like, you know, it's a performative anti-mimesis. But you have goth, you have uh, uh, upside down, you have uh, 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 Luciferianism, and you have suddenly these occlusions that are cool. I never thought they were cool, but some people did, and they create subcultures, et cetera, et cetera. I have, I have one last thing that I want to bring up today because we've got to round this off, but we can continue the discussions forever. And I'd love to dig into textualism with you guys again and certainly the theme of cool. But, um, okay, of the people who go on stage and are reasonably successful, the two types, they're the narcissists. There are people obviously driven by the attention they did get when they were kids or whatever, they want to compensate for that in their lives. And they're the kind of guys when they're finished with their concert or their performance on stage, they'd like to stay there for as long as possible and get the flowers and get even more attention. They can't get enough of it, right? <laughs> They're the other guys who walk up on the stage. They look like they want to escape somewhere else. They don't want to be there, but they do their job, right? And uh, as soon as they're done with their job, they run off and have what we call the rape shower in Sweden, which is essentially like, you know, you have a shower after you've been raped, like you want to clean it all up. <laughs> and they send an invoice and they never ever want to see that audience ever again. They're agoraphobic. Yeah. And the reason why agoraphobics go on stage is simply because it's the way of dealing with the agora, dealing with a crowd that they hate. They, they love the fact that loads of people are just walking around without no purpose, knowing where, knowing where to go. This is more Tito, like in full effect. 50,000 people walking around, don't know where to go. But if you stand on a stage, you got 50,000 people in front of you and they do as you say, you're in control of the crowd. So that's agoraphobic. And the irony is, of course, that we know that these characters like Prince and Whitney Houston and Michael Jackson, these pop stars who committed suicide, took tons of drugs at the end of the day, they were probably perceived as being narcissistic and that's probably where they're wrongly diagnosed. They were deeply agoraphobic. That's exactly why they sort of secluded themselves more and more the further they got and finally killed themselves with the opiates and nobody could really help them because they had just gay sayers around them everywhere from Hollywood. And that, that's when you go absolutely insane, you go and kill yourself. And I think the understanding of the agoraphobic element of being performative is absolutely key to cool. Because I think what we do, when we know that the world is full of narcissists, and we know that a lot of people want to be number one of the charts, a lot of people want to be on the stage, a lot of people want our attention constantly, screaming at the top of the lungs for our attention, then the guy who really is the shy guy who stays away and looks the other way, but just has enormous talent of some kind. Yeah. That's the enigmatic character. And that's why we're going to go after the agoraphobic characters even more. And they're going to be cooler than ever. But we're probably also going to plunder them and kill them in a whole new way. Because we're going to go do a lot of media scapegoating with these agoraphobic characters. Yeah. We've only just begun doing it. But I don't see any force right now that can stop us from doing it. Because we love them so much. Yeah. Um, I, I saw Dylan and he, he, he played with his back to the audience the whole time. It's like, it's like this is an old guy. And... He's supposed to be playing his songs how they're supposed to be doing, and he was he just distorted all of his songs and played with the back to his audience. So I wonder if he could know, just be bored with it because he's done those songs so many times. You it know, could be, but he, he just changes yeah. everything and he has. His yeah, but, 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 but remember that's... that put the agoraphobic versus the narcissist again. Put a relation in here to try yeah. to understand the two. For example, I've met a lot of people who want to be, have a career in the music industry. As soon as I see they have a very narcissistic tendency to go on stage, I said, "Why don't you go and line up to the chorus line for a musical?" It's, it's just better because you're going to work so hard because your narcissism means you're going to work hard, 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 hard. To yeah. Perform, perform, perform. Be really, really, really good on the stage and be utterly bland and just mimic it. Because mm. that's what hardworking people do, right? Whereas the, the, the real artists are the ones who are scared shitless of the audience, don't know where they ever put a record out there, hide somewhere in a corner, smoke weed like crazy, take drugs just to escape the whole thing. But when they do sit down and do things, it becomes really magical because they have such a direct access yeah. to what they do. Because the only thing they can think of is that what they're doing must be channeled to an audience they're terrified of that they still want to have some kind of relationship with. I'd like to add to that uh, an interesting twist, which is that you can start off non-agoraphobic and then end up agoraphobic 
vis-a-vis yes. vis-a-vis a, a, a preponderance of attention. And I think that you know this is an interesting place to take the conversation. Obviously, we're we're probably out of time or whatever. But I'd like to think of attentionality as physical. Just just suspend disbelief, right? And think of attentionality as physical. And when all those eyeballs are on you, you start to sort of compress into essentially a meme. In your, in their eyes, this is why when Dylan went from acoustic to electric, people fucking rioted. Because in their eyes, you have become a meme. They have repeated you so often in their lives that you've become reduced. And this is this idea to me of the person becoming a mascot and it's essentially a meme, but you become a mascot and by the compression of attention, the physical compression of all that attention, you start to shell out. And you great. You know what? You know what? We can have an axis here because if the sort of destructive axis, narcissism versus agoraphobia, the other one is pure exhibitionism and pure voyeurism. And let me make a stand for that. I think exhibitionism and voyeurs are fantastic. I think all of society is operated by exhibitionism and voyeurism. When we're aware of it, it's wonderful to play with. It's like man and woman. It's, it's like, it's like and, and if you're socially exhibitionist, you tend to be sexually voyeuristic, et cetera. You can balance these things in your own life, et cetera. But we live in a society increasing with exhibitionism and voyeurism. And we need to save exhibitionists from mass narcissism. We need to save them from the misunderstanding that they are narcissistic because so many other people out there are narcissistic. Because otherwise we'd be so sick of the narcissists taking the position of exhibitionists where we want people who want to perform and show their best, right? And, and we have other people who take their place and take the position, intrigued to get that position. And in reality, we're then gonna go chasing like mad for the few little agoraphobics out there who have a genuine cool about them that we love so much that we will probably kill them in the process. Yeah, and-, that, and- they, This is the, the price we pay for contemporary hyper narcissism is that we have made exhibitionism and, and voyeurism dirty when it should be clean, beautiful thing. Yeah. And, and, and I've, I, just to cap that, I've suffered myself. I didn't start off agoraphobic. I, I am now. And now I'm working myself out of it. But I experienced a compression of eyeballs where I no longer had my own lacuna, where I, I used to go to the market and I'd whistle and I'd be like, I'm in my own cinema. Now I'm not in my own cinema. I'm being witnessed even when people aren't fucking there. I can feel it. And I've lost sort of the, the lacuna of self, the, the membrane of self, the, the occlusion. And, um, and I think that part of the way to save the uh, exhibitionists is to promote this, well, membranics, is to have tribes within tribes within tribes, and then you have your outer sort of structure and your communication and your yeah. distribution, but then you come back into an occluded space. Yeah, the first yeah. thing I did was that I stopped touring with bands that looked electric and probably were clever to perform with and started only touring with bands where I loved the other guys. Yeah. The first membrane was around the band. So that we right. could go out on stage and do our work and do our job and perform to tons of people if we had a hit record that year. But then we could, then it would be us isolating, having a party afterwards with the roadies. And that was the fun of the whole tour. That was key. Mm-hmm. It absolutely saved me. So this brotherhood me. kind of. Have like, an yeah. inner membrane to protect yeah. you from Sister. that kind of uh, exposure. Yeah. And I think yeah. exhibitionism and voyeurism works the same way. It has to be directed. It has to be understood because otherwise he's thrown out there and played around with and people don't understand it, then it's gonna get very, very messy. Very yeah, I messy. Think, I think we can die, the, the specialist, the aura can die by exposure, right? So, so in the attentionalist age, maybe one of the philosoph- philosophical things we walk away from is the idea of preserving aura and coming back to cool as like actually like aura rich and, and awesome. How do we preserve aura in an age of total exposure? And, um, you know, whether that's going offline and, and being, you know, completely, you know, breaking the, uh, the media and leaving the eternalized state of, the, of media or some sort of occluded space within media. What a perfect note to end on. Aura, that's fantastic. next. Yeah. And should yeah. we all try to read maybe Walter Benjamin before our next discussion again or reread him or whatever? Or... Sure. Well, we, we can email each other and come up with other things, but I'd love to continue this conversation. I think this conversation so should be studied. You know, uh, I think I think this is the kind of conversation that people should should study in school or something. <laughs> There's so much stuff going on. It's amazing. Anyway, um, 
Maybe yeah, and the I also think the eyeballs and the eardrums and and whatever they're watching or listening to. That's what yeah. It's all and about. I also yeah, I would like there to be a part two at least if if you guys are all up for that because because this was pretty awesome. Yeah, this is really help. I'm trying to figure this is this is amazing. This is really helpful. This is the only way to figure this shit out. Yeah. Um, I think I've taken it <laughs> this as far as I can myself, and then you know I'm bringing attentionalism into it and trying to figure out all of this and, and being in a dialectic and a dialogue with you guys is like, is epic. It's great. It's needed. So yeah, I'm all about it. I, I would be down to return for sure. Okay, cool. So re, uh, we got to read uh, Walter Benjamin and then we'll meet again. <laughs> uh, the avant-garde and, and aura. All right. Aura is key term. But I mean, why don't we drop each other some emails and, and people who love, who get engaged with this conversation, contact us for God's sake. We love your input. Yeah, See, we indeed. And, and Sweeney, yes. I want to know more about uh, Chen. Zochen, yeah, yeah. Zogchen. Thomas knows a lot about that too. Uh, yeah, okay. we, could, we, we could we could all talk about that. We could we could go we could talk about Sutra and Tantra and Zochen and all that and try to relate that. I think that you could yeah. relate that to the philosophy of cool in a way. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Thank hey, you. Cool guys. <laughs> cool. cool guys. <laughs> good night. Oh, good night. Good day. Good afternoon. Cheers. Peace.